Mohanty uh, will be speaking and uh, and uh, sharing his experience on this very vast subject of extraarticular deformity, which is a very very uh, interesting subject for Dr. Briard uh, specifically. And uh, I may add here uh, that uh, Dr. Briard is the one person who has been one of the first one to talk about the consequences of uh, correction of extraarticular deformity within the joint. He, is, uh, he will be speaking to us uh, on this subject. I will start introduction, introducing the subject uh, to you. The controversies are always a bit in uh, deformities like this. Even a, a normal looking, innocent looking joint where you will feel that you will just make the cuts and joint replacement will be done. There are certain consequences of corrections of the deformity, which may be in the metaphyseal region uh, in this area, or in this kind of a patient where you have a severe deformities or the patients like this who have a mid sharp deformities. It could be uniplanar or multiplanar deformity, uh, metaphyseal or diaphyseal deformity of femur or tibia, or both femur and tibia combined together. And uh, most of these uh, extraarticular deformities are because of the previous fracture, malunion. It could be because of the uh, surgical reasons like mal malunited osteotomy. Relative less number of cases are reported of the Paget's disease, hypophosphatemic rickets, congenital dysplasia, and, and, and similar uh, situations. What are the uh, two basic uh, to introduce that what, what are the ways of correction of the extraarticular deformity? One, that is intraarticular correction and subsequent challenges of the joint stability, which uh, you will have to manage. And uh, our senior faculty will be explaining that subject in detail. Or the second aspect is the corrective osteotomy. That is the, uh, you do the osteotomy distally and make the corrections at the deformity level or just proximal or distal to that level. Measurements of lower extremity are very important. As you see, you must have a assessment of the, what is the mechanical axis of the femur, what is the tibial axis, and what is the anatomical axis of the femur. The anatomical angle, the tibiofemoral angle, uh, this is the level of deformity. This is the, this is the angle of deformity, which uh, normally also you see that the, uh, the ideally you should have a uh, zero alignment, which is, uh, uh, what is what you are seeing here. The normal alignment is like this, around 87 degrees to from the distal femoral cut and tibia around uh, 92 degrees. If, you, if the patient has a deformity in the diaphyseal area or in this metaphyseal area, this alignment will be affected. And the whole discussion of today of two hours will be that how to correct, how to manage this deformity correction within the joint or at the level of the deformity itself. The subject looks difficult, but I'm sure that our senior faculties will be able to explain very well. And, and at the end of this session, our uh, colleagues who are sharing with us the knowledge uh, will be able to understand this subject very well. I'll start with one, one simple case and I'll leave some questions to our faculty, which they will be handling. This is the patient with the multi-level deformity of both femur and tibia having the deformity in diaphysis, having the deformity in metaphyseal area, deformity in the proximal tibia, and also the distal tibia, what you, what you can see. This patient, when you see the is walking, you can see that there is a lateral thrust in the joint when the patient walks. And the best examination of this patient is from the back side. And you see the left side is far more serious. I'll, I'll consider on this slide, which you see that if you see the normal three degree axon rotation of the implant, you see that, that there, is a, there is a significant amount of the opening of the joint laterally in flexion, no. and that can be corrected in the by, by the correction of the, of the uh, cutting jig or with the use of the rotation. Yeah, that is what you see that oh. there is an excessive internal rotation after trial implantation. Now that is what, what is very important. And that is why in this particular case, uh, we will discuss whether the intraarticular correction could have been possible or what we did here, the extraarticular correction at the level of the deformity was right. 
the patient's x-ray of both the sides having the osteotomy of only the tibia on the right side. On the left side, the osteotomy is of tibia and femur both. We see here, this is the nine-year follow-up of this patient. You see the extension stem right up to the level of the deformity and beyond this probably it was not possible unless you do a deformity correction at proximal level um, as additional. That's the patient walking within three months of the surgery. The various functional positions. And that's what we see this patient walking at, walking at nine years of surgery. We can see that there is a deformity in this level, deformity at the distal tibial level, but there is a group, there is a significant amount of stability of the joint. Now, now we will be discussing uh, after this case. Uh, I'll invite uh, Dr. Dr. Briard to give his uh, guest talk on this and explain us more on this uh, uh, so far looking difficult looking subject. But I'm sure that he will make this uh, a simple subject after this. Discussion. Dr. Briard, please. You want to discuss this patient or you want me uh, to no, give you no, my I, talk? I think that I have just given the introduction and now okay. Dr. Briard will, will give his talk. Okay, fine. So I share. Yes. Okay. So it should be. Okay, fine. So I, I call this talk challenges, solutions, because there are several solutions, compromise. That's what uh, Hajij was asking. And sometimes what's the price to pay when we do th these surgeries. It's maybe quite difficult. So when we have a deformed knee, I think it's very important to look what's happened inside the joint, apart the collateral ligament, uh, in the li collateral ligament frame, and what's happened outside. And uh, we will we try always to keep the joint uh, in the good condition. So we try to have a knee. When we perform a total knee in neutral, and we like to have the joint line horizontal or perpendicular to the mechanical axis. That means that we will try to have a normal prosthetic, a normal uh, prosthetic uh, femur and tibia, and we want it mobile and stable. So the distal femur is essential when we look at the knee because it's controlled by the mechanics of the knee with the epicondyle and the collateral ligament. And it's rotating around the epicondyle, the transepicondyle axis, uh, the flexion extension axis. So femur is the key, it's very important when we are making our total knee. So we have the collateral ligament frame and uh, with the transepicondyle axis and the collateral ligament and the tibial cut. So that's a joint box with no, normally it's fairly normal mechanics. And then you have what happens outside of the joint, and we want to have the alignment at, in order to perform a good total knee, I would say construction sometimes. So we see that we must look at the shape of the bone. We have the mechanical axis and we have the joint line. So we can have a femur varum, fe like here, or normal femur or femur valgum, and the same for the tibia. So when we will change the joint, the femoral joint line, femur, uh, from oblique to perpendicular to the mechanical axis. So uh, if we change the orientation of the joint line, we will have, we will offset the, the, the epicondyle with respect to the center of the prosthesis. And I call this a rickshaw effect. Sometimes your, your ligament will be tight or loose. So that's uh, very important, I think, to have the best mechanics. And then we will look in flexion, what's happened for the stability and for the patella. So as we have seen with Rajesh, you have congenital deformity and you have malunion. 
So we need a 3D description and uh, looking at the three planes, coronal, sagittal, and horizontal. But to be more simple, uh, we will be dealing first uh, with a coronal deformity, and we will look at the consequence according to the site of the malunion. If the malunion is far from the knee joint, the consequence are, are small. But if it's near to the near to the knee, then the consequence will be much higher with the obliquity of the joint line and malalignment. So how to correct extraarticular deformity? First question, is it femoral or tibial? You see me always speaking of femur because the femur control the mechanics. So if you want uh, to have a stable knee at the end, I think the femoral component is very important. We have three options. We can correct inside the joint the extra articular deformity with ligament release, or we can do a sliding condylar osteotomy to bring the new transapicular axis perpendicular to the mechanical axis, or we can correct outside the joint with osteotomy, and then where should you do it? So if first, uh, that's what we do most of the time, correcting <coughs> Inside the joint. I think sports medicine tell us that if we want to create coronal laxity in extension, as we see here, we have to severe the posterior capsule, all the corner here, MCL and the cruciate ligament. So that's a quite a, a release. So we will see each specific deformity. First, we will look at tibial deformity, like in Januvaro, where you have here normal femur, normal femur, and tibia varum. So tibia varum. Tibial deformity uh, is, is, is not so difficult. You can perform a medial release with a good sleeve technique, and you will bring this, this joy line perpendicular, and then you will have a good correction in the in extension it's rare to have to do an hto in severe tibia varum an inflection you elongated the the medial sleeve here so with a strong release elongated mcl sleeve there will be no change in the femoral implant rotation and you can be perfectly stable and no problem with the patella so that's quite easy and we can see here cases, you see with 30 degrees, good sleeve technique, no problem, no problem for stability, no problem for rotation for the patella. Femur valgum now, in the genu valgum, very frequently with normal tibia. So here we have a femoral deformity. So the, the, the joint line is oblique here because you have a deformity, usually in the metaphysical area. So we will do a release of the lateral structures with the technique, uh, by crossing very frequently, and uh, we will try to have to reorientate with the prosthesis, the distal femoral joint line with a lateral, with a lateral release. And uh, well, we are fine in extension. But now in flexion, we have to look at the consequences so the lateral structures are very, when they are released, sometimes you may, they may become weak and you may have instability, but for, in order to be stable, because you lengthen them, you will have to rotate the femoral implant in external rotation. So consequence inflection, femoral deformity. If you want to be stable, you have to rotate the femoral implant in order to be stable. And even when you do this, you see your transepicondylar line won't be parallel to the joint line. Now, so you can have complication and that's a dislocation after uh, independent cut with reference to the posterior condyle. So there was laxity inflection and you can see here what's happened in this case because the cut was with reference to the posterior condyle. So be careful with a femur, femoral deformity, you have consequences in flexion. So you have problem for stability. You will have to 
over rotate the, the femur in external rotation or use a constrained knee, VVC. So remember, femur, consequent flexion, valgus deformity. Well, you have the risk of poor soft tissue and you may have to use a constrained knee. Now femur varum, another femoral deformity. So, well, you say, okay, we do a release, we make the cuts perpendicular to the mechanical axis and uh, it's fine in extension. But when you look in flexion, you see you lengthen these fractures. So if you want to, get, to have stability, you will have to rotate your femur in internal rotation. And then look at the patella where it was previously, you will have a subluxation of the patella, femur varum. So be careful, femur, extra articular deformity on the femur, it's always more difficult. And then you have consequences in flexion. Here it's varus, rotation for stability, internal rotation. And if you use independent cut, you, you will have medial laxity and you will have to use a constrained knee. Now, tibia valgum, like for instance here uh, after after HTO, you see, look, the, the joint is normal, you know. So here, if we plan to do the cut perpendicular to the mechanical axis, we will have to cut a lot of bone of the medial plateau and that will create laxity. We call this resection laxity. And that's what was done with independent cuts and you see the medial, the medial laxity. So we have to be careful and this one, so we had medial laxity and in order to repair it, we had to use a wedge here and to redo the osteotomy. So tibia is easy, but valgus is more difficult for the soft tissues. Well, you can look at the joint line in the sagittal plane with the tibial slope. Well, very, I must say that very frequently uh, we can play with the processes and get rid of this problem as we saw in this case. So first message, medial release is a safe and easy technique for tibial deformity with a good sleeve, but femur varum, femur varum. Oh, that's a problem. So we will, we will think of it because of uh, internal rotation or medial laxity inflection. Lateral release is more difficult and carry a higher risk of secondary femoral tibial instability and may require constrained uh, design. Femoral deformities as a rule are more difficult because their correction influence both extension and flexion gap. That means the rotation of the femoral component and femur valor, uh, it's more difficult. Uh, and this has consequence on stability and pattern of tracking. Tibial deformity correction does not influence the rotation of the femoral component in flexion. Varus release is easy, different from valgus, but we have to be aware of femoral deformity. So you see the way we will be thinking. And we repeat it all the time. Extraarticular femoral coronal deformity correction have to induce secondary rotation of the femoral implant at 90 degrees. Extraarticular tibial deformity correction is different, but because it does not change the balance at 90 degrees, so it does not change the rotation of the femoral implant and patellar tracking. Second method, sliding osteotomy. We have been using this now for more than 20 years. It's allowed to balance the collateral ligament in the coronal plane in order, and we keep them very strong, but it's addressed only femoral extraarticular deformity. It's make a new transepicondylar axis perpendicular to the mechanical axis. It does not change the knee inflection. So it's very interesting. But if you have a significant uh, femur valgum, I, I think uh, with, uh, sliding medial condylar osteotomy with flexion gap first and then bring uh, the, the osteotomized fragment more distal to correct the coronal deformity is a good method. And look at this patient, he has no malrotation. It's only a femoral deformity and uh, inflection, the knee is fine. You can make the cuts, 
Then you do a sliding osteotomy with correct cut of the distal femur, and then the patella is cracking while he is well aligned. So that's very simple surgery. Post of course is like a simple total knee. Another case done by my fellow Golding in Chongqing, and uh, well, that's quite a severe deformity. And uh, well, two screws, what a nice correction. And here we have uh, uh, my first case. Uh, so many years ago and 24 degrees and LCS, uh, it's not a very constrained knee. So now, if you are looking for ideal correction of the deformity, you should do it at the deformity level. Or if the deformity is severe, or if you have coronal deformity, but also sagittal or transverse, you may have to consider to do metaphysial or diaphysial osteotomy but you must know that femoral osteotomies are more difficult for the surgeon and for the patient post up. Huh? This lady had a trauma. She had a tibial intraarticular uh, well, complex fracture. And uh, she is uh, 20 degrees, but she is already stiff. I did a huge release and uh, well, she's well corrected, but uh, she remained uh, stiff as many as many traumatic uh, post fracture knees. In this case, this he was a surgeon. He came to me with uh, this knee. Uh, they did not correct me, Julie. Huh? And so I did. Uh, he was stable, so I did an HTO here, open wedge, and uh, no release. And uh, he got uh, well 110 degrees. He came not with a, such a good motion first. That's a rare case where you have a tibia varum with internal malrotation. And uh, I had to do the ostomy, I derotate here, but that's quite rare. This uh, malunion, okay, femur varum. You look if you have malunion in, in the transverse plane and he had internal rotation. So, that you walk very badly when you have virus and internal rotation. The gait is very bad. So after trauma, always ask for a CT to know if there is a rotation. And in, and in this case, I did the metaphysial osteotomy. Well, they are not so young sometimes. Huh? And because it healed faster, I could use a smaller approach. When I do a derotation, I always use two plates. Uh, and I never had any malunion uh, due to my surgery. This is more complicated. She had a supracondylar fracture. She is fed up with surgery. She already had uh, two years of surgery and she came to me. She said, do a total knee. I tried to convince her that uh, osteotomy would be better, but she refused. And the gait was very bad. And she had 30 degrees of internal rotation. So you, you understand why she was so unhappy. And so I did an open wench, I am rod and two plates and uh, it's healed very nicely. That's another case where you have a coronal deformity with sagittal deformity here. So the question is, uh, do you have, what, uh, what is the importance of the flexion uh, malunion here? So uh, there was some internal, so we did the uh, CT, so there was some internal rotation very frequently. And so I did the osteotomy uh, uh, and you see two plates and uh, that's, uh, you see the correction not complete, uh, but it's fine. This is a more complex knee because this patient was a very famous surgeon, uh, professor in Amsterdam, and he had a sort of four uh, type of fracture when he was a teenage, gross disturbance, failure, epiphyseal disease, shortening. He was fed up with surgery and came late. And, and he came to me because somebody said that I could do simple surgery. So he have a femur varum deformity, no significant malrotation. But when I look at the X-ray, if I try here, you know, to have a joint line, 
perpendicular to the mechanical axis here, that's a lot. So I, if I do a sliding, I had to slide too much, I think I, I could have complication and the patient would have the complication. So I did an opening wedge osteotomy, you see here, here you see the stem and I used to, the plate does not need to be very strong, but uh, it's all for the, for the constraint due to the derotation. And he's fine, he's walking. Uh, he married a, a, young a younger woman in uh, Switzerland and he's hiking in the mountains. And uh, tibia valgum, huh? we have seen, and we see some of these uh, after high tibial osteotomy. Well, tibia, we say, oh, it's not so difficult no consequent inflection. So, uh, yeah, okay. But when we look here, if we cut this, we will create a huge of laxity immediately. And so, uh, we, if we try to lengthen here, when you have such an overcorrection, you will end up with a weak or loose uh, lateral structures, and you will end up with a lateral instability inflection. So I think when you see this, uh, even if there is no consequence on, on the flexion, you have to be careful. And uh, you have, I think, if it's not much, you can use a transepicular line in flexion and do like independent cut and use a constraint design. But you know, the age of the patient is very important when you choose a method, but most of the time, and it's very simple, you have to redo the HDO, you keep the joint with good ligaments, and it's an easy procedure. And as we do here, that's very, very simple when you are used to it. When you see this, oh, no, no, I can't cut so much bone medially. It's him. No, that's too much. I will have to lengthen of all of this, my lateral structures. No, I can't do this. And uh, that's the osteotomy, uh, quite simple. Okay, where to do the osteotomy and even when, when, uh, when you, you should say, well, oh, we have to do it at the site of the malunion because that's ideal to correct all the components of the deformity. I, I tried this, but look here, I did my osteotomy here. I use uh, IM rod, a lock, and uh, well, it's healed, no problem, but uh, I still have some deformity. So sometimes you correct the extraarticular deformity, they may be well for some time, and then it can be, they can be okay, so. You can correct at the level, but sometimes it's long to heal, especially at this age. I had one which never healed. Uh, the technique may be difficult to correct in the free plane, and often you end up with an under correction. And sometimes it's not wise because you had a previous uh, healing and previous infection, or maybe because of the age. So sometimes, the surgeon may decide to first correct the deformity that was, was done here. We had a malunion with 30 degrees of external rotation here. And uh, he used this, he did his osteotomy, uses his plate. Uh, you see the osteotomy here. And he waited. And in the second time, uh, he did the TKA. And so, and the patient is pleased with the results. So that's, uh, if you are not too experienced, and remember that femoral osteotomies are not so easy. Tibial, it's okay. That's another patient from Professor Mao in Changsha. And uh, he said, no, no, shall we? I won't do it in one stage. So he did, the, he did the osteotomy first, got a nice correction, and then in second stage, use a, a simple uh, primary knee and uh, got a good functional result. So usually it's easier to perform a metaphysical osteotomy. And you saw many of my cases where I'm doing metaphysical uh, osteotomy, either closing or opening wedge. So you have to plan it very well. You have to look at the fixation uh, can you use a prosthetic stem? We have seen with Rajesh that sometimes it's difficult to have a stem in a, 
in a better position when you have a big curve of the femur and you, you can use staple place tibia and uh, uh, tibial tubercle uh, osteotomy. I use it very often. So when you plan a concomitant osteotomy from a union with good collateral ligament, that means you will keep the, the joint strong. Is it there? The screen is black. Okay. It's worn back. Yeah. yeah now it no, has it, come back. It's nearly finished. Huh? Okay. Uh, John, we, uh, thank you so much uh, for a uh, wonderful uh, discussion on extra articular deformity. Uh, uh, and I'm sure that this, this will be considered as a landmark uh, lecture on this difficult subject. And you have explained us very well. Uh, John, we, would you like to tell us, uh, we'll, we'll use five minutes for discussion on your, top, on your topic. Like to tell us that yes. what be the deformity uh, where you will suggest the uh, the extra articular osteotomy? Would you like to say that say fifty more than fifteen degrees of deformity you will you cannot correct inside the joint in the femur? Well, can you stop sharing the screen and uh, then? Uh, in the meantime, please stop sharing the screen so that the next speaker is is uh, able to come up. Should be okay. So, well, you, you have to look uh, at the, how is a patient. You know, sometimes in a patient, you may say, okay, I will use a hinge uh, because of stability problem. And uh, if I have uh, access to the medullary canal. So I think the patient is very important. It's not only the deformity. And I think in all the cases coming, we will see this. That's ideal, huh? what I show. Well, I think uh, the, the extra articular deformity uh, has a lot of consequence if you want to release and lengthen the ligaments. So, uh, so what you how mean, many degrees? Yeah, what you mean is that if there is a, a significant instability within the joint, just using the hinge joint or just using the more constrained implant is not the answer. That, that's what you mean. Well, well, if the patient is, uh, is young enough, when you look at survivorship, the survivorship of hinge is not so, so great. So I'm always trying to operate a patient only once in his life. So the life expectancy make you decide which solution you will find. And I think most of you so maybe we can have this discussion after the other speakers and all together. Right, right. Uh, and what, what uh, level do you do the uh, osteotomy in a bow femur? You know, you showed uh, uh -huh. Dr. Rajiv showed a good bow femur and you showed uh, it is always at the metaphyseal level or at the apex of the deformity. Well, bow femur, you, you have different uh, severity. Huh? Sometimes uh, most of the deformity is distal, but sometimes it's uh, the wall femur with a bow. And we saw the patient of uh, uh, Rajesh. I think uh, this patient need uh, maybe the two osteotomies. So you have a, so you have to plan, you have to design because you don't want to be running into problems because this patient was very young, eh? the lady that Roger showed us. So you have to anticipate that she may need a revision. And uh, so I think uh, uh, this lady was needing an osteotomy in the mid shaft and maybe then sometime in the distal area. Uh, if it's still too much, you, you have to do a metaphysical osteotomy. If it's not so much, maybe you can, uh, you can do it with a, with a sliding medial condal osteotomy, but I think she needed uh, more with mid shaft osteotomy. So, what do you think? So what? John, what you are suggesting is that uh, these patients are to be operated, better to be operated in two stages. In one stage, you do the diaphyseal osteotomy and fix it up. And the second stage, you do the knee replacement. So you make your plan, okay? And then you decide 
uh, if you are not so used to, I don't speak of you, but I speak uh, for the younger surgeon who are hearing us, they say, oh, these people, they do everything in one stage. That's difficult. I think uh, you can you can do it in one stage, but that's a lot of work. That's uh, a lot of trauma. You know, you have to be thinking of the trauma, but you can do approach, you plate in the mid shaft, and then you can do your total knee. You do bilateral, right? you do a lot of bilateral. So you do one knee with two operation. Right. And you will agree with us that in our patients, the, the generalized curvature of the bones is too much because of the osteomalacia, because of the osteoporosis, because of the weight of the patient. So we have many patients who have a multi-level deformity. The center of rotation axis is not one, but it is more than one. Yeah. Yes. And uh, well, okay. Let, let's let's try to be uh, simple. I mean, to do femoral osteotomy, tibial osteotomy. That's several. That's several stage. You you can't do too much. And uh, I have seen patient with Elisa Ruff on the tibial side and osteotomy open on the femoral side because at least Zaroff is not good because uh, on the femur because it would make the knee uh, uh, stiffer. I think so. All right. Yes. Thank, thank you, John. We, um, do we have any question on the YouTube, uh, Shubhranchu? Yeah, we'll check the YouTube. In the meantime, we request Dr. Bosley to share his yeah. screen. Uh, yeah. Uh, we now have any, any questions on YouTube? Yes, sir. We've got one question from Dr. Rajiv. Yeah. Uh, while correcting a femoral extra deformity, do you prefer to correct it fully or prefer to leave two or three degrees of residual deformity? Residual uh, for me, I, oh, I try not to make mistake of a correction. So I hate over correction. It's more trauma and, uh, it's, uh, and the functional result is not as good. And today the message is, ha, uh, huh, Polyethylene is very strong. We have good poly now. So we should keep some, some degrees of the, of the deformity. So I like to keep three degrees. Right. Dr. Pradeep, please. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, it was a wonderful lecture. Uh, it's a very complex situation and you have to understand things very clearly. So I'll just go briefly on extra articular deformity correction by intra-articular technique. So as you know, you have to be very perfect about your pre-op calculation and intra-op decision of soft tissue balance. Yes. Uh, so basically with extra-articular, as you know, you correct intra-articularly and leave the extra-articular deformity as long as the mechanical axis is good. So advantages, it is a single surgery, early ambulation, Issues related to osteotomy are avoided, like risk of non-Indian delayed union, chances of infection of two surgeries, implant problems, breakage, loosening, etc. So these are the advantages of intra-articular correction. You have to be very careful. It's not so simple. Now, broadly, there are four important issues when you decide about intra-articular correction. First, you must understand magnitude of deformity site from the knee where the deformity is there. It is varus valgus and tibia or femur. So good preoperative planning, wage calculation and soft tissue planning preoperatively. So intraoperatively you are very comfortable. Now some basics. Now if you see femoral deformity, the basic principle is mechanical axis, right angle and what is the, whatever the uh, implant thickness and if this goes, the osteotomy goes beyond the attachment of the collateral, you cannot do intra-articular correction. So like this here, it is inside. So you are preserving the collateral. So it is good for doing a TKR. This is the femur. Now coming to tibia, you have to draw the distal tibial mechanical, anatomical mechanical, which is same. So draw the mechanical axis of the distal part and see where it crosses the tibial plateau. If it is inside, then yes, you can do it. If it goes outside, you cannot do with intraarterial correction safely. 
Now, tibia or femur, it is well explained by Professor Brad. And tibia, you know, it is only flexion extension, so there is not significant uh, problem with the rotation and uh, gap balancing. But femur, as you know, distal cut, extension gap, posterior cut, flexion gap. So when you correct the soft tissue balancing, you are actually lengthening and there is a more extension gap and flexion gap becomes less. So you need to adjust, understand this. And on top of that, there's a rotational issue which you must understand and you can preoperatively see with CT scan. Deformities, best deformities, easiest deformities are coronal plane, varus and valgus. Less suitable, these are very challenging and some people have uh, shown good work like Professor Bayard has also done, but only experienced people can do minor up to 10 degree of uh, prokaryotum, recoveratum. It will affect the range of movement and rotation. You have to be very careful. So these are little complex. So should not be tried unless you are experienced. But coronal varus valgus is easy. Now basic concept of uh, this waging. Now this is a good work. I'll show you. Uh, extra articular deformity of 20 degree but as you go away from the knee you can see now the deformity is here so uh, sorry deformity is distal so wage is less as you go up closer to the joint the wage is more the angle of the wage is more as you come closer to the joint now this is a slide from Professor Argensen's uh, rights only. So a uh, lot of work done by Wolf and it is so very clearly as you go away from this thing. So for 20 degree overall malalignment, it is fixed. If the deformity level is higher away from the joint, you need only two degree angulation correction. But if you go close to the joint, it is 18 degree the quantum of deformity is same, 20 degree. And you can create lengthening of the collateral ligament. So that needs to be adjusted. So varus and valgus issue, it causes unequal collateral ligament laxity. Lateral structures are more dynamic. So if you keep slight uh, laxity, one or two millimeter may be accepted, but medial structures are poor. So you cannot leave the medial laxity at all. So varus deformity, it leads to lateral collateral laxity and you can release the medial collateral and equalize the gap. While valgus, you need to correct the lateral collateral elongation. So this is a varus. You need an elongation of the medial structures. You can equalize it. So there are three options. Slight, if you relieve it, it may be tolerated well. You need to do posterior uh, medial collateral release. Actually, it's a minimum lengthening. If it is not possible, then third option is always a safe option. Always you keep it ready. It's a constraint. And valgus, the lengthening of the lateral collateral is uh, challenging. And you know all the thing. You may require epicondyle or osteotomy or keep a constraint ready. Boeing is a uh, most challenging. You have to do preoperative planning. You may require two-level osteotomy. It is a little difficult intra-articularly. Many times, uh, you may need a uh, offset Wait, stem. Mostly. Yeah. Excuse me. Yeah. I think you have to do cases only because this okay, is... Okay, fine. So, this is a case uh, where uh, you can see the deformity it goes outside. Not so, it is not accepted. And it needs osteotomy. And this is a classical example, TBL varus. And you can see... There's an angulation of 18 degree and uh, it needs proper uh, intra-articular correction, which is done. And this is a 12 year follow-up and she's completely straightened up. Similarly here also malunion and complete correction. And this is a femur. So again, 11 degrees, small degrees and rotation, you have to be very careful. So in conclusion, magnitude and distance from the knee is very important. Extra-articular deformity, more than 20 degree, not advisable. Tibial deformity, better than femur. Varus correction, better than valgus. 
rotational and sagittal are difficult collateral ligament insufficiency may require constant implant and ankle and hip deformity should not be corrected thank you uh, thank you pradeep it's a, it's a wonderful discussion on the difficult subject so what you what you uh, have explained is very rightly that uh, if the deformity is closer to the joint it will have more problem and the same subject was explained by dr briard also uh, in the meantime can you stop sharing your screen and the uh, I'll stop. Yeah. Stop. Uh, uh, dr rajkumar uh, to share his screen dr rajkumar will be speaking on uh, total knee arthroplasty in extra articular deformity using the computer navigation uh, good evening to all uh, thanks dr rajiv for inviting me and that was a very good uh, uh, initial uh, lecture by dr brad and also followed by dr pradeep almost covering almost all the uh, entire topic so let me let me go into the okay this is i'll go straight into the case this is a 61 year old male who had pain in the right side right knee due to arthritis and he had a history of old uh, femur fracture which had been done for a mal union so the mal union here is more in the coronal plane and uh, uh, luckily the sagittal plane there was not much of uh, deformity here in this case so if you look this is the alignment x ray you can very clearly see the mal union see if you the mal union here is more of more looks like in the uh, mid third of the femur so we all discussed about the level of the mal union so whether it is near or far away Uh, from the joint line so here it looks more in the middle side so pre operative tympani is very very important in these kind of situations so the magnitude of the extra articular deformity the two important points here is the magnitude that is in degrees of the extra articular deformity and the location so it was always also discussed so here the cora the center of rotation angle center of rotation angle is very important in related to the knee joint the location of cora determines so in this case if you look at that and if you draw that uh, mechanical axis and the anatomical axis the cora is almost in the middle third lower third junction it is not in the middle third it's in the middle third lower third junction and if you uh, draw a perpendicular li uh, uh, line to the mechanical axis you can see that the line goes and too much of uh, lateral side lateral femoral condyle bone you will be taking if you are doing in the conventional way so that is the difficulty here and then too much of discussion whether to do an intraarticular correction or a two stage procedure or a single stage procedure so here the most important point here is the cora we have to uh, uh, get the correct cora and then decide so as angular sever severity increases and the cora is in close proximity the extent of soft tissue release is necessary to achieve a well balanced knee increases along with the need for either a constrained or a hinged device so look in this case if you look at the templating for a, in a coronal plane the femoral de deformities are less well tolerated than the tibia in the coronal plane because a corrective cut of the distal femur will change the balance of the knee only in extension i am not talking about the rotation the rotation will change the flex flexion as well as dr bayard said but here the corrective coronal plane it will affect only in the extension so that is actually less well tolerated why because in tibia if you take it uh, affects both uh, flexion and extension so you can balance it easily but in extension alone in femur it will mismatch and so there will be a flexion extension gap imbalance so almost in the literature it is accepted like even dr rajiv asked about the degree uh, how much degree but in the literature if you look at it if there is an extra articular deformity more than 20 degrees in coronal plane and more than 10 degrees in sagittal plane you cannot rely on the intraarticular correction so it becomes very difficult to do an intraarticular correction that is what so navigation helps in correcting the gross deformities so in this case i preferred i used a brain lab navigation system pfc sigma was the implant so ca calculated the range of motion and the vca angle where if you are doing a manually you have to do an intramedullary jig and then the correction all those things here the planning really helped a lot with the navigation so the rotation also was 3 degrees extra i didn't uh, rotate too much as, because the with the navigation i was able to get my rotation so that the flexion gap was balanced so the slope was also balanced here and you can see the uh, amount of thickness uh, the gap in the flexion gap and in the extension gap 
the rotation of the femoral component also the distal femoral cut verification and the rotation of the femoral component also was both in flexion and extension was checked rotation alignment was checked 3 degree 3 degree external rotation was achieved in the femoral component and this is the post operative x ray 3 years post op uh, and if you see this this was achieved with the help of a navigation so i pr predominantly use navigation mainly in extra articular deformities or uh, whenever there is a femoral nail or a uh, any other implant in the femur thank you uh, th thank you rajkumar it's a, it's a very well done uh, navigated case and uh, in the meantime can we request dr anup durani to share his screen uh, let's have a discussion then uh, yeah. we can yeah. okay yeah. Uh, Rajkumar, can you stop sharing your screen? Yeah, yeah. Sorry, sorry. Oh. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Can you tell me that uh, you know this? Uh, you told the twenty degree and ten degree on average in the coronal as well as sagittal plane. Is yes. it uh, in all the levels, be it proximal part or middle part or the lower part of the femur, that uh, same ten degree and ten degree principle see, apply or uh, it depends? No, no. See, the 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 degree of, the degree that cora is almost same, but the only thing is the if it is goes farther away. If it goes farther away, then the chances of intraarticular correction is reasonably easy. If it the the cora is very far away, that actually there is a calculation which says for every uh, um, level of uh, far away, you every uh, degree of far away uh, you can calculate by like for example, if it is in the middle third, and if you are able to say so for that, you what you have to do is you have to draw the mechanical axis. draw a mechanical axis draw a perpendicular line and if that line perpendicular line crosses the intraarticular uh, crosses the collateral ligament attachment yeah. then you have to be very careful if it is goes very far away you cannot do an intraarticular correction yeah, right yeah. The, the biggest uh, difference of the navigated and uh, instrument based surgery is that you you cannot put the intramedullary rod when you have a deformity in the in the shaft of the femur so that yes. is the biggest advantage of the navigation because you are able to uh, to draw the correct mechanical axis of the femur uh, do you agree and can i can i ask dr bryard about this uh, if if he had done this without a navigation what would have, would have been his thoughts in this case right well maybe uh, in this case i would have used uh, in my planning uh, i think i would have say well it's a good joint I like to keep the joint uh, without uh, too much release, and uh, I think I like to keep my ligament strong. Uh, so uh, I, I so how to do it? I think sliding medial uh, condyle would be very easy. Okay. Uh, in, in my practice. Okay. Okay, but this this deformity was almost in the middle third, lower third junction, and uh, regarding your intramedullary rod. Ah, oh. okay. Uh, I, I have tricks in my place, for which I, I can uh, I can use a short rod. I calculate before, and I know how much I should cut medially and laterally. That's my navigation. Okay. Measurement on the X-ray and reproduce exactly. <laughs> okay. Right. That's a cheap navigation, but I I use also a lot of navigation. Huh? I did in your place, huh? Yeah. Yes. The navigation. <laughs> it's, it's your your feeling that when you use the computer navigation, yes. you have to do the lesser release. Definitely. Yes, definitely, because the your your totally you are taking away the intramedullary rod need, and the. Uh, the amount of bone cuts was also less if you see the insert size it was very very minimal so you you are very much very stable uh, ligament balancing you can achieve with the navigation asit asit as a question so asit that asit. means another advantage of using the navigation yes in these cases right yeah asit as a question rajesh yeah subranchu on the same question uh, you know this figures of uh, what degree of uh, deformity is there If you see Wolf's uh, publication, JBJS 2002, he mentions quite significant deformities like 30 degree, 30 degree of coronal plane deformity in femur and tibia, isolated can be corrected by intra-articular correction only. 
and you know somewhere or the other when we see all this presentation presentations 30 degree is a huge huge deformity so whether am i not getting something right or this uh, publication which is there by wolf uh, that needs a little bit more discussion you know especially dr brad what he has to say on this so dr brad what do you say that how much the deformity in the femur and how much the deformity in the tibia uh, you will accept correcting within the joint intraarticular yes yeah well you have to look at the age of the patient i think how long is your patient going to survive but the problem Uh, it's not so easy to say I will use a hinge because of the rod, and you may not have a good uh, correct access to the medullary canal to use a to use a to use a stem. So for me, I try well. If I have 30 degrees, uh, if it's uh, genuvarum on the tibia, uh, I. I 30, I would do uh, HTO because it's a, uh, it's a uh, very very easy and uh, so the for the femur, yeah. that's the different. I think femur, it's more severe and uh, for the femur, I would look which technique I have to use. 30 degrees, I think I would have to use metaphysiol if I can. Uh, osteotomy, yeah. Right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, John. John uh now our next speaker uh, is dr anup dhurani yeah any question in the youtube are we now uh, no sir no significant question i think the okay. questions have been answered okay we move on to dr dhurani yeah uh, can you see my screen and can you have a voice yeah. Yeah, yes anup yeah. okay. so this is a 50 year old male with history of distal femur fracture mm -hmm. operated three times 12 years back first he has a implant Then the implant got infected, which was removed, and then a quadriceps plasty type of operation was done. Now, although there is no implant, we need to be careful that these cases may be having occult infection, especially if we see cavity in the distal femur. We be very careful. So his biological markers were all right, CRP, ESR, but that's one concern that we had about uh, hiding uh, infection in the distal femur. That's one thing. Second thing is. that this is a deformity in which uh, there is patella baha so we have to take be careful about that most important we have to do with a ps knee we can't do any constraint because we do we can't put the stems in this particular knee as you can see that the femur is translated medially and that is causing the metaphyseal varus deformity of about 16 degrees but this we can correct intraarticular so that's that's the uh, basic study of this x ray and this is one case in which can you please do a full screen full screen sorry full screen please oh yeah sorry sorry for that down down niche all right now this is one case if you can see that there is coronal deformity there is a sagittal plane deformity in terms of uh, the flexion of the distal femur it's a varus deformity and there is a rotational element also so it is truly a 3d dimensional deformity and this is one case where ct scan is indicated to exactly know what your rotation has to be and in this particular case the rotation was around 7 degrees and we'll see that as we do our navigation and also important in this case this was operated three times previous is your planning of your incision and there was a lateral incision there was a midline quadriceps plasty incision so a lot of incisions there and the distance between the planned incision and the lateral incision should ideally be 3 to 4 finger breadths but in this case it was not more than about 2 and a half finger breadths let's take a small surgical look at this small surgical video that's the uh, patient's gait those are the incisions the range of motion is only 0 to 30 medial laterally he is stable patella baha that's one reason which causes decreased range of movement is patella baha that's the incision planning very important you have to be very careful and meticulous with soft tissue dissection this is one case where i would do a rectus snip at the outset that's marking of the rectus snip there it goes because the knee is not flexing at all so rectus snip is important clearance of the gutters and then you do a lateral release right at the outset so the way i would approach a 
metaphyseal fracture stiff knee extra articular deformities to start my dissection lateral to medial and not to start medially because that would open up the medial soft tissue sleeve and cause instability and remember we can't use a constraint joint so lateral release first rectus snip first intra articular soft tissue additional lysis then start doing lateral and last comes the medial exposure because if you start doing medially you will open up the medial joint space and cause instability in flexion medially and that's what we have to prevent so there that comes last the lateral work first the intra articular work second and that then the medial work the range of motion after all this is about 120 the bad news is with the patella on still it is about 70 80 degrees and that is what the patient is going to get about 90 degrees and that should be counseled to the patient the navigation pins proximal and you can see that the distal femur has a flexion deformity you can see it on the navigation how beautifully it maps it takes us lot of the guess work out it's a hyper extension of 3 degrees varus of 12 degrees now and you can see that it is correct in inflection that's very important to know that means that this joint is not suddenly going to open in flexion because it is hyper extension we have taken a less two of distal femur and then we have to be very careful with the rotation so you can see resection of distal femur is 2 mm less because of hyper extension deformity again navigation helps us to see the sagittal plane of the deformity that's so crucial next importance is the rotation we know by ct scan in this particular case that we have to do our rotation anywhere between 6 to 7 degrees and we took a 6 degrees of rotation being careful very careful that we are not notching laterally because when you increase your rotation you may notch laterally so you have to be careful of that and you don't open the medial gap too much because we can't use a constraint knee in this particular case because there is translation of the distal femur as i mentioned earlier Uh, so prepare the femur first it's a great idea to do that in this particular case uh, finish the femur first because a stiff tight knee with lot of fibrous scarring and there is patella baja once we finish the femur we can do a tibial cut uh, in this particular case it was 8 uh, mm to balance the gaps and then another trick that we can do for patella baja uh, in this particular case was to resect 2 mm less distal femur and second tip is to superiorize your patella button by a couple of millimeters so that your patella does not impinge on the poly these two small tricks help to prevent impingement of the patella button on the poly and give you that extra 10 10 degree range of motion which is so critical for these stiff patients otherwise they'll just be stuck at 70 you want at least a 90 for these patients uh, this is the soft tissue balancing a reduction osteotomy because it's a 15 degree varus uh, so we need to release in extension mostly because in flexion we saw the knee was correcting so deformity is primarily in extension in coronal plane so you correct that by doing your release and then finally uh, that's you can see we are at 3 degree varus and 5 degrees of flexion so that's the kind of correction that you want and uh, that's the final correction and with the patella on you will see the patient is getting 70 to 80 good case to do pike crusting of the quadriceps to get the patient up to 80 or 90 degrees without the patella the patient can go up to 120 but with the patella only to 70 and then you do pike crusting superiorize the patella button a millimeter or two as i said to prevent impingement use a high flexion type of a poly in this case so that there is no impingement of the patella on the poly so those are the important principles for this particular case and that's the final alignment the full length in coronal and sagittal plane and that's the post op x ray you can see that there was no no way we can do a conventional knee in this case there is uh, there is no way you can pass a intramedullary rod here we kind of aligned the joint line because we resected less distal femur superiorized the patella button the initial range of motion was only 0 to 70 now it's 0 to 80 so that's what the patient's expectation should be 0 to 90 in uh, in these kind of cases uh, we can have some critical discussion on this case if you like yeah uh, thank you anup i think it's a, it's a wonderful case excellent yeah um, interesting case because of uh, i feel that 
there is a possibility that you had a uh, subclinical possibility of infection in this in this kind of a case you rightly mentioned that that not to use the extension rod uh, anup you did the lateral release first because the patient had multiple incisions on the lateral side is that correct no the the knee dr raji was just not flexing so the first is the rectus nip you clear the lateral gutter and if the patella is just not moving out of your way and it's very tight because of lateral scarring of the previous incision better to do a lateral release so that your exposure becomes easy and ultimately you need it for better tracking no, correct for the purpose of discussion i'm i'm talking about that you, we could see sure. that during the surgery you were handling <coughs> the patella was trying to uh, subluxate laterally so you must have done a lot of uh, uh, release of the patella as well so after the lateral retinicular release as the video was showing the patella was tracking nicely tracking nicely yeah. with the patella on the range of motion was only 70 to 80 because of quadriceps shortening in patella baja right, right. When, and when, what when, about tibial tubercle osteotomy in these cases rather than going all these parameters you already have patella baja why not a tibial tubercle osteotomy because we already have a quadriceps release three times we are doing a lateral release we are doing a snap we are doing a medial release so where do you see the placement of uh, tibial tubercle osteotomy in these kind of parameters tibial tubercle osteotomy manoj we can use if you are not able to expose the knee at all once your knee is going up to 120 as i showed before putting my navigation pins after i did my release my knee was flexing flexing to 120 i've done ttos in cases where the knee just does not budge at all that's the indication for a tto Dr. Pariyad, your viewpoint because I feel a knee that has been handled with a snip, with a medial opening, with a lateral opening, the kind of quadriceps that you retain by the end of the day, uh, it's a debate to you know go through where to get in a TTO. Well, I think you are asking about tibial tubercle osteotomy because you want to raise it, yeah, so that you will get more flexion. Uh, mm -hmm. So the the problem with this traumatic knee was really the tight extensor mechanism, uh, and uh, there is no way that you can get a better result because you did pie crossing of the ex, uh, of the quad, which is uh, that gives you between ten and twenty degrees. Uh, it was described by Chetranawat. Uh, it's a good thing, but well. I think uh, the other possibility was to win uh, 10, 10, uh, 10 degrees more by uh, doing a tibial tubercular osteotomy, not for exposure, but for better flexion, I manage. Uh, uh, John, what's your suggestion? Huh? What, what I know okay. is, is that yeah. to manage the patella baja, he shifted the patella one or two millimeter proximally. And I resected less. Yeah. Tumor less. Yeah. yeah. Because it was a hyperextension deformity, so I knew I, I am resecting less distal femur and I superiorized my patella part. And if you see the post-op X-ray, there is no patella bar. Uh, Anup, here uh, I'll just put one one thought. Uh, if you had done the tibial tubercle osteotomy, you could have shifted that that osteotomized segment of the tubercle proximally. And and does it? Uh, do you think that that would have given you some advantage? Not really. I don't think so. Whether you tackle the quadriceps mechanism proximally or distally, ultimately you are adding a little bit of morbidity. And I disagree with Manoj that doing a quadriceps snip doesn't leave a good a good quadriceps. No, 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 no. Quadriceps with lateral with medial. Right. Why should no. you move it on? You do a quadriceps snip. You do yeah. a lateral release. You do a medial release on some thing, some knees where quadriceps plasty has already been done in the past. What medial? It's a standard incision. You do a quadriceps snip. You do a lateral release for a patellar tracking and patellar, uh, uh, you know, mobilization. That's all. And you remove all the inferior fibrous scar tissue, which is causing patella bar. Correct. Shobhanshu, you have a question. Yeah, uh, Anup, uh, you corrected patella bar by, you know, taking less cut on the uh, tibia and more cut on the femoral side. So less on the distal femur. Uh, sorry, less on the distal femur and. Uh, you know, taking more on the tibial side, then you corrected hyperextension by taking, you know, uh, less of, uh, you know, cut on the tibial side, you are telling. You are so, how For hyperextension, because the knee was in hyperextension, yeah. I, I would be taking less distal femur because your extension gap is already there. Yeah. And because how, you less distal femur, that helps in tackling patella baja also. 
this is what okay. I mean. my question is that initially you told there was a deformity in the sagittal as well as in the rotational plane yeah uh, how did you manage that yeah so sag sagittal we saw that there was flexion of the femur so you keep the femur in that much amount of flexion because you measured it by ct scan and you because you are doing navigated you saw my uh, femur was in flexion of about 6 degrees instead of a usual 3 degrees so that you are not notching so you have a femur which is flexed you keep your femur in flexion so that you don't notch as far as rotation we had done a ct scan so i knew my rotation was 7 degrees i took a 6 degrees to to ensure that my gaps are nicely balanced and i am not in internal rotation okay the, dr brad how would you have done without navigation um, uh, to put the femoral component in about 6 degrees of flexion and uh, uh, correcting the rotation as well well i i think today you have to use navigation Uh, we start using navigation in 2000 in France, so I, I love navigation. So I, I agree fully with navigation. But what is very important, you can't plan everything. This case was very complex, so you know all the parameters, but you don't know exactly what you will find during your surgery. So he assess the flexion gap, and, uh, and then you assess well. You had the recurvatum, so you must cut less distal. But but your thinking uh, progress during the surgery to to fit with this knee, and uh, you could uh, I could hear that's the way that uh, it was done this surgery. You record this this, and then you say I must do this. Well, the stiff knee is very complex. It's not. Uh, because you have adhesion all around. And then later, the quadriceps uh, had a scar down and the rectus is too, uh, is too short. Uh, you, you don't want to do a Jude in this patient to get more flexion because uh, it, there is a danger of uh, infection. So if you do too much trauma, you increase the risk of infection. So. It's all these things that you have to consider, but you can see the way it progress the the surgery, thinking and taking decision each step during surgery. All right. Yeah. Thank you, Janvi. Um, uh, now, since we don't have any questions from the YouTube, uh, we'll go on to uh, Ashit. Can you can you share your screen? Yeah. Okay. And uh, now we'll be discussing. Uh, so far, we were discussing the correction within the joint. And Dr. Ashit Shah will discuss uh, uh, about the correction by the extraarticular osteotomy. Am I visible? Yes. Okay. Right. Good evening, friends. Thank you, Subhran Shah and Rajiv, for this opportunity. So, moving away slightly, we are going to go for now extraarticular deformity. Uh, correction so that is my case a 67 year old lady with left knee pain for last 2 years she presented to me she had gradual worsening and limiting uh, her uh, walking standing ability and activities of daily living sig sig history of significant injury to left leg about 5 years ago which was treated with massage and splint for 3 months she never got any medical treatment for the same currently when she came to me there were no medical issues like diabetes ischemic heart disease etc clinical examination and the picture uh, range of movement 5 degrees of flexion deformity to further flexion 85 degrees non correctable varus deformity distal to the knee joint 1 cm of true shortening and no distal circulation or neuro neurological issue and these are her x rays the ap and the lateral and the long leg scanograms uh, so left knee is the one which is the trouble and as we can see there is complete obliteration of the joint space because of which she is getting pain for last 2 years and that's drawing the mechanical axis pretty standard now we need to basically plan for the surgery so whether we plan an intraarticular versus extraarticular correction we've heard dr brad and dr pradeep bosle and also subsequent talks and we discussed it out whether it's a one stage or a two stage correction we need to do whether any further surgical technique different surgical technique we need to follow implants and additional hardware we need to keep in mind when this particular surgery is done 
So now, when we draw the lines, if we draw a, the first of all, the coronal plane deformity was 17 degrees, as we can see here from the axis of the distal and the proximal uh, uh, part of the tibia. Apex of depo deformity was about eight centimeter from the joint line. So this is uh, these are degrees and angles which are quite uh, debatable whether we can do an intraarticular or an extraarticular extraarticular correction. But if we do an extraarticular correction, an intraarticular correction here, perhaps the tibial cut would be directed in this manner, which would cause too much of excessive uh, resection of the lateral tibial condyle, and then subsequent lot of medial release and additional constraint. So though it was on fence, I decided that I would go for one single stage correction. And this is what we performed. Obviously, uh, there was a fibular osteotomy that we did. We did a tibial osteotomy, proximal tibial osteotomy, lateral close wedge osteotomy, as we can see here. Tibial preparation with intramuscular, uh, intramedullary uh, guide for the stability while doing the bone cuts, a stem tibia, and a derotation plate and bone grafting. If you see here, the by doing all this, the articular spacer, that is the polyethylene size, is the minimum. So here, doing an extra articular correction gave me a perfect mechanical axis. And obviously, the steps are slightly different. We prepared the femur first. And while doing the tibia, we started rimming intramedullary. And when the reamer came here, that's the time we opened up the osteotomy, osteotomy site, performed the osteotomy, corrected it, and then further passed on to the reamer. So that in immediate stability was uh, achieved, and then we completed the tibia. Additional derotation plate and bone grafting was put just to make sure that there is no problem with non-union of the osteotomy, because that can be one of the major complications of the osteotomy. These are the x-rays, and the first one, which are at three months. Patient was made to walk immediately about uh, uh, next day, uh, partial weight bearing with the walker. And within two or three weeks, she started putting full weight over it. And this is two months, uh, sorry, two years x-ray with complete consolidation of the osteotomy and good overall alignment maintained both in coronal and sagittal plane. That's the case. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. And I would right. Uh, thank you, Ashit. It's a wonderful case. Can we go back to the X-ray? And in, uh, uh, I think for the for the uh, discussion sake, yes. would you tell us that what were your what are your normal steps where you have to do extra articular osteotomy? Correct. Do you go femur first in these cases, or do you suggest that femur should be prepared first? And yeah. then the tibia? See, if we uh, do an osteotomy here, you will have in tibia first, then you will have an unstable segment here. So here, what I did is I completely prepared the femur, right. put the femoral trial, and then got the tibia sublux anteriorly forwards, started using the intramedullary guide, intramedullary guide. So when we started rimming from the tibia, and when it came to the apex of the deformity, when you know that this is the apex and that you can see by uh, C arm, that's the time you open up the incision further distally and create an osteotomy at that time. So there are no unstable segments here. As soon as the osteotomy is done, your reamer is almost up to here. You have to pass it on further down so that you get immediate stability once the correction of the uh, deformity is done. So once intramedullary guide is put inside, then you put mount a cutting block on the tibia and take the proximal tibial cut. So you have stability and at the same time you have the cut here. So that's a very good tip, uh, friends, that uh, in these cases, the better thing is to prepare the femur first and prepare it fully. Uh, oh, Ashish, uh, could you tell us the reason uh, why the fibular osteotomy you had to do? Could right. you have uh, avoided that? Uh, yes, in hindsight, I would, I should have, I could have avoided that. But all that we wanted was basically some compression occurring at the fracture site and fibula should not cause, you know, a distraction of that fracture site. You know, that's the standard teaching we have for our fracture training. So here in the hindsight, I know I could have avoided it, but that time, you know, about three years ago, I thought even if I do, you know, I didn't want anything uh, left there so that this uh, osteotomy goes in non-union. Uh, can I have opinion of Dr. Briard here? 
about the two things one that uh, is the fibular osteotomy needed because this is the site where you have the sciatic nerve the, the common parallel nerve is very close in this area especially the nerve for extensor hallucis longus and uh, this is the site where the nerve to extensor hallucis longus separates uh, so it's a little risky area and do you do you think dr briar that uh, uh, osteotomy can be avoided in these cases with this kind of a deformity or it must be done? Okay, well, I, I think osteotomy was the best choice. Uh, I, I think there is nearly more danger uh, with a vessel and uh, at the level of the osteotomy, I think you have to be very careful. Uh, you, you can decide, well, I think you have to do the osteotomy. You can do an opening wedge or a closing wedge. Any, any case you have to do, you will have to do a, a fibula osteotomy, I think. Right. Uh, so the question is, uh, can you do it uh, intra-articularly? I think it's not a good decision, but some people may have the experience to do, to do uh, intra-articular in this case. And, uh, Nobody? Yes. Uh, uh, yeah. You know, my question was, what was, how did you decide your entry point into the tibia before taking the cut? Where did you take the entry point? Intramedullary. Yeah. Intramedullary guide, generally, yeah. where you have the tibial spine, okay, slight medial to that. So, tibial spine, we have medial tibial spine and lateral tibial spine. On the medial wall of the tibial spine, of the medial tibial spine, that's where you put the entry. And obviously, first, once you make a hole, and once your rem uh, the rimmer, initial rimmer goes, check it on the on the C arm that you are going in the right direction. Number two, uh, could you have avoided the plate by putting a good, tightly, snugly fitting in your stem extender on the TBL side? Hmm. Because it's an intramedullary implant. Hmm. So anyway, it is a you know, load-sharing implant. Correct. And since you are doing osteotomy, so it's in a compression mode. Once the patient is walking, then uh, there will be union. Sure. It's just uh, for uh, you know additional stability, or could you have avoided the plate on the medial side? No, it was Rota once rotation. the you change a rotation, so that's maybe why you use this. Yeah, it's a derotation plate. If you see on the screen, it's like a derotation. You know, it's slightly you have to change the you know we had to change the rotation of the distal fragment and then fix it in uh, that particular uh, uh, point with this derotation plate. Uh, it obviously gave me additional stability apart from intramedullary rod, which has been there. Okay. Uh, so so yeah. do you suggest these patients to be partial weight bearing for a certain period of time uh, because you have, you have put a plate? Yes, I mean, with a rod and a plate and screws, you know, they're fairly stable. They can start walking immediately. Uh, I mean, they can start putting full weight, but generally the instruction is to walk with the help of a walker and not straight away go mad on it. Just put slight weight, you know, less weight over it and be careful about it. But within two weeks, the walker was off and she was just walking with a walking cane. Uh, yeah. One tip I like to share here, when you're making the TBL cut, uh, you, you put the TBL jig and uh, seat in flexion. The uh, and 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 uh, match it up with the posterior femoral condyle, posterior cut of the of the femur, and that gives a good idea about what should be your TBL cut, uh, because uh, uh, otherwise it is very difficult to assess uh, what Shubhranshu was asking that how to uh, what should be the care in making the TBL cut. Mm -hmm. uh, Shubhranshu, you have a question, please. Yeah, yeah, just the benefit of the you know viewers. Uh, Asit, can you tell what will what should be the length of your uh, tibial stem extender? How long you extend beyond the osteotomy? It is actually two twice the length. The length should be twice the actual uh, diameter of the bone at the level of the osteotomy. Do you understand? Did you get it? Yeah. Okay. The two cortical diameters beyond the beyond the osteo. So, yeah. Yeah. One small question. Can I ask? Yeah. Yeah. yeah please, please, please. Yeah. Uh, wonderful uh, result. Excellent. But two things. You did close wedge osteotomy mm. from medial side. How did no, you? No. Uh, yeah. No, it was a lateral close wedge, as so we can you see. You it. took incision yeah. on both the side. No, no, no. It was the same TKR incision which was extended distally. Okay. Because here I was lucky that the deformity was quite 
close to the uh, to our exposure so i could extend that insulation lower down and then i could do all this osteotomy because i wanted to make sure that if i change the rotation i want to put a plate so to put the plate i anyway wanted a little longer incision so in that i could uh, do the close wedge osteotomy at that time at, at the, that side and one important question actually looks like a very classical case for intraarticular correction you mm -hmm. have to do soft tissue balancing right. so what was your point against it right so here if you see in the pre operative planning if you take and if you take a cut which is at 90 degrees to this line the cut will go somewhere like this and it will remove so much of lateral tibial condyle that to balance that knee i would have to do significant amount of medial release and then i would be looking for some additional constraint or constraint implant or something more like that so to keep it very simple and straight forward not to use any hinge or any the further processes i just wanted to do a straight forward pfc you know uh, knee extra articular correction was something that uh, really appealed to me so it's a, it's oh. a very interesting uh, question uh, what you asked uh, dr briard what what is your opinion on this because yeah. the difficulty was 17 degrees 17 and degrees. Uh, um, I, I think in this case for surgical technique, it's simple. Well, the joint is normal. I'm thinking of the joint and then extra articular deformity. So you were doing first the femur, you had an uh, independent cut. Yeah. And then you say, well, how to do my, my tibial cut? Well, you have to do it like in a kinematically aligned knees. You know, you will create underneath your prosthesis enough space to put your your uh, tibial uh, tibial spaces if you want, and then you, you decide. So it will be very stable, and then you will go and do your osteotomy. So it's, uh, I think we are thinking this way now. Huh? You replace the femur, you make the space because the collateral ligaments are normal. So. And then it's quite uh, straightforward. Uh, yes, no? uh, that's correct. So, John, we what you say is that where where you have a deformity closer to the joint, it is easier to uh, to use the extension stem, do the osteotomy, and what what Dr. Ashit Shah has shown very well, uh, it, it makes the joint uh, surgery very simple, rather than doing yeah. the intraarticular release. Uh, thank you so much. Now we'll invite Dr. Vikash Kapoor. Uh, to speak on the uh, uh, extraarticular deformity correction using the osteotomy, extraarticular osteotomy, and plate fixation. Uh, Dr. Kapoor, would you like to share Thank your screen? You. Yeah, I think, is it visible, my, my screen? No, no. No, not yet. Uh, is it okay now? Yeah. Okay, so... Please, uh, please make slides so. Certainly. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Dr. Shkubranshu and uh, Rajiv Bhai. Uh, this is uh, slightly what has been discussed, but it is in a different way. Uh, primarily being a cruciate retaining surgeon. And this is slightly lower to what uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Ashish has just shown. It is uh, primarily at the proximal diaphyseal area, metaphyseal diaphyseal area. So the correction, as you can see here, all the x-rays are here. It is a, a deformity more in the coronal plane, and it is this plane is reasonably aligned. And on this side, you can see the extent of deformity, which is almost more than 20 degrees. So uh, here you see uh, the classical uh, gait of the patient as he walks. Can, am I audible to everybody? Very yeah, well. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, thank you. So this is what it was when the patient came, and this is how the left side was. Uh, from the side, from the back, and he was managing uh, somehow. And this is what we had in our hands for the correction. So what I did was, I also did a fibular osteotomy, but I took a separate incision, which was far down the line, far down the line at the, the um, uh, proximal third, uh, distal third of tibia, almost a uh, mid third of tibia, to avoid the plane uh, of uh, difficulty in uh, neurological injuries, etc., And I took out uh, approximately two centimeters of fibula 
and did a separate incision altogether. So this was what was a point which we had discussed initially in this particular case, in the previous case. And here we started uh, the surgery with a separate incision. As you can see, uh, this incision was a long incision where I wanted to do osteotomy as well as uh, do the surgery with the same incision. So here you can see what I'm doing is, uh, I'll, uh, I'm putting in two wires which are going to converge in the coronal plane at the top of the deformity, which will come out through the apex of the deformity. Now this is in sagittal plane. These are two parallel wires which are going and converging. And these wires both, are, these are not parallel, they are converging wires. And these two wires are actually parallel to the joint line. So this is how I'm going to show you. This is, a line, this is the wire which I have passed into the joint, intra-articular, you see? And here you can see the distance between these two wires is equal. So this wire is parallel to this wire and this wire, here it is coming out parallel to this wire exact parallelism is maintained in the sagittal plane to each other so that is what we have the proximal wire of the deformity now at the cora we are going to take out about i'm going to under correct as dr bryant said by about two to three degrees so i took out about 1.5 1.5 to 1.7 centimeter of the base of the triangular wedge which is a uh, wire which I will pass from here to here into the deformity and I will take out a wedge from here to here. This I can afford to do because I have taken out extra amount of uh, fibula from the uh, uh, already. So I am not worried about uh, 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 an effect of both stringing of the tibia or the deformity. So it will not be tight. As you can see, now I have my planes very clearly marked from where I am going to take the cut and here I take the cut, uh, as you can see, uh, from the deformity. And this was the deformity which we had started off with. So uh, we take out the wedge. We are here. You can see the wedge being taken out. First of all, uh, we do uh, two separate uh, saw blade. Uh, we make the cuts with the saw blade parallel to the wires. And after making the cut completely, uh, posteriorly, 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 we leave a bit of bone and then we take the osteotome and break the posterior cortex. We break the posterior cortex and we take out the wedge as you can see, the wedge being taken out. So once we have the wedge, we see about one and a half centimeter and we compare it with the fibula also, which is thicker than what we have already taken out. So we are okay. And now we close the deformity because there is a hinge at the back. So we have a hinge at the back with which we are able to align the tibial uh, ridge, as you can see, and correct the rotation accordingly. And we then kind of uh, do the closure of the osteotomy. And we start the application of the plate on the medial side. Now this is an osteotomy plate with a unicortical screw. So we give unicortical screws on the side and then this screw is meant to just hold this particular thing in position. This screw is just meant to hold this whole thing in position, the constructed in position. So now we have a very simple case to do. And uh, I want to re retain my cruciate if it is fine because cruciate should not be a problem in this particular case. Therefore, I have minimally constrained need to be used and I'm going to do a standard TKR with a minimal deformity correction, which I need to do intra-articularly. And you can see these are the routine steps of TKR, which we are doing one at a time. We do an extra-articular standard tibial correction, uh, standard tibial cut. We don't need to go intra-articular in this case. We do our femoral cuts, as you can see. And uh, that's uh, the standard uh, technique of TKR. And tibial cortical osteotomy is fixed by unicortical screws. So there is enough uh, intramedullary uh, space left for us to do a conventional uh, uh, pass in a rod inside. So, sorry, I'll just come here. And once we have done this, we kind of uh, have finished the femoral and tibial cut. We put in our uh, uh, 
uh, trial implants without uh, the extenders and we do at this point of time only we can see very easily our balancing inflection and extension as you can see with the plate holding the osteotomy very nicely and we can check the stability of the osteotomy as we do the flexion and extension and we do the full correction and the balancing which is absolutely very straightforward and simple now we do and see our alignments we go ahead and do our uh, standard uh, alignment which we can do with conventional instruments we don't need any any navigation or anything we can do a standard second metatarsal to the anterior superior iliac spine uh, measurement as you can see we can do all the rotational things which we want to do here and we have a good well aligned uh, situation and we mark it after marking it we go ahead and do our intra articular uh, uh, rod fixation as we want to do for the constraint uh, the tibial rod and once we have done this as you can see we can at this point of time only know whether screws are going to impinge or not which they did not as you can see the case so do routine tkr balance the range of motion extend the preparation and testing of any kind of uh, uh, screw impingement and alignment assessment once we have done this we come back to our surgery and uh, we do our patellar preparation which i don't replace we put in our extender which is an additional uh, now it actually is going to make things very stable inside we cement it like a normal knee we cement a femur and we do all the routine closures etc and that's what we get and the flexion extension we can see completely normal the patella is absolutely well aligned there is no issue in the patella tracking etc so uh, this is the final x ray which uh, we can see it's uh, well beyond the osteotomy site and this was a malunited fracture and you can see that the distal fibular osteotomy is quite distal to the actual uh, place where we have done a tibial osteotomy and uh, it gives me more comfort to be out of the way of the nerve or any uh, uh, nerve injury if it happens inadvertently and you can see this is a, a 10 mm spacer the lowest spacer in this particular requirement and uh, minimally constrained knee with a pcl intact thank you very much uh, th thank you vikash uh, i think it's a, it's a wonderful case and, and a different perspective uh, what difference uh, vikash you showed us here is that osteotomy uh, incision fibular osteotomy incision was separate you did yes. the fibular osteotomy first before you yes. started making yes. the cuts for the for the yes. uh, total knee yes uh, here my my question will be that uh, vikash what do you say that when you do a osteotomy first and you do the fixation of the osteotomy uh, then you will you are committed to that particular alignment uh, at the osteotomy side so when you are using the extension stem uh, the anatomy if you are using the intramedullary extension stem is is it will adapt some degree of varus valgus Uh, don't you think that uh, that as that advantage is minimized if you remain committed to fixing the osteotomy side before yes what happened was in this case uh, first of all i used uh, the tibial anatomy landmarks to align the tibia in a particular direction and then with a previous uh, two screw fixation of the plate i ensured that i am getting an extra articular uh, i saw my extra articular alignment of the tibial tuberosity to the second metatarsal while doing this surgery and then i fixed the plate completely so right. i had a complete idea of exactly which way i am going to go and as you saw while doing the intra articular uh, standard uh, straight forward uh, uh, intra medullary guide it just did not uh, have any problem or impingement because i used about 8 to 10 mm thick screws only and they were unicortical screws they were just meant to hold the osteotomy and not to give too much of stability or fixation hmm. uh, very right uh, let's have the opinion of dr dr john lee briard on this uh, well that's a concept 
of doing osteotomy first and then doing a simple total knee and keeping ligaments normal. Yeah. So, and uh, well, he, he used uh, all the tricks. You have to make uh, the cut, one perpendicular to the mechanical axis and one parallel to the joint line. So you're, the only tiny problem you can have is when you have wear uh, of the tibia and uh, you, how to assess exactly uh, the, upper, the upper limit of your opening wedge when you have wear. Huh? You know this, huh? Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah. Now, yeah. Now, then, so correct first osteotomy and then the procedures. That's um, one thing. Right, thank you so much. Because there is a question from the YouTube, is the plate necessary or can we get away with using the longer uh, stem? Yeah, I what think what's your opinion or uh, what's the opinion of Dr. Vikash on this? Yeah, the, uh, I think uh, Ashish, yeah, please carry on. No, I think so. This, uh, your level of fracture uh, was quite low. So putting a stem lower down and getting a good grip into the distal fragment would have been difficult just with a isolated stem. So in your case, Plating was, I think, so necessary so as to keep the alignment right. And then, as Dr. Uh, Briard said, just do a standard primary totally without touching the collaterals. So, plate succession to fix the osteotomy was good enough because it's too far distal from the, too far away from the joint. It, yeah. it so provides additional rotational YouTube, stability. That's yes. what we discussed. So, answering the, answering the question of YouTube is uh, very clear, I think that the plate fixation is always a good adjuvant to the intraarticular stem because intraarticular stem by itself, if uh, it is not a very tight stem, it might be a problem sometimes. Although we must try to have a tight fitting stem, which itself can be a very important fixation. And secondly, but, you know, uh, if there is slight rotational instability, yes, the stem yes. would not be able to cover it up. So we cover need it. the plate uh, to uh, you know uh, neg negate that uh, rotational stresses, so it's classically described as a derotation plate. So what is right? What we are rightly explaining is that the plate should be used uh, to prevent the uh, rotational instability, right? Correct. Correct. And, and and if the osteotomy is required distally, then it is better to fix the plate. Correct. Correct. And uh, uh, one one uh, uh, one explanation that the graph that you have. Uh, by by making the uh, cuts uh, in the joint, you must be using it for the bone graft. Uh, that aspect probably you must make it clear. Correct. We have plenty of graft available there, so uh, yeah, it better be there better near the osteotomy. Yeah. Use there. Right. Yeah. Uh, any questions, Shubhranshu? No, that's fine. Thank you. So uh, we'll go move on, move the, on to the next case. Yes, sir. We'll invite Dr. Harish Bende, who will uh, explain us. Uh, uh, about the multiple osteotomies, how to do the, uh, uh, how to manage the deformity at multiple levels, uh, how to do a total knee with using the multiple osteotomies. Okay. Uh, let me get the screen. Can you see this all? Yeah. No. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it is a 48 year old male patient. Uh, he was working in a, in India progressive deformities in both the legs, significantly painful knees, and barely able to walk. There was no history of trauma in his case, and he has got significant deformity like this. Now, if you can see, it is very difficult to explain exactly why he got so much deformity and how he could walk till the point came to this end. It wasn't a multi-osseous uh, deformity. I mean, upper limbs were completely normal. The femur of both sides were completely normal. And if you can see, he has got deformity, which is going to multiple levels. And uh, this was the picture. You can see that uh, the deformity had progressively developed with a sequential formation of callus. And there was also some uh, his, you know, appearance of some fractures happening and healing along even the fibula. So it was, we tried to do a histology and try to ask people but we couldn't actually identify the cause of these multiple deformities which the patient had. Uh, but he had significant pain, uh, difficulty in walking, and he required a surgery. So our uh, task was to get it right. Now, obviously, we have discussed this so far. There are two options of doing it. One is a, one, do it in two stage. 
we can do a corrective ostomy of the tibia because it is a purely tibial deformity. The femur is almost normal, so I have not seen the femur in this X-ray. So one option would have been to get the multiple deformity correction by doing a wedge ostomy, wait for that to heal, and then do a TKR in a relatively smaller, similar way. The patient was keen to get a single stage surgery if we can do it. So that's what we wanted to do. And uh, so during the surgery, if you can notice, during the surgery, if you can notice, this is a X-ray and that's a joint level. And you can see that this is an extended position of a knee. The knee is extended. But if you can see the level of a tibia, it is at 90 degree to the mechanical axis of the femur. That the long axis of the femur, that the upper articular surface of the tibia, and that is your uh, distal part of the shaft of the tibia. So you can see in an extended knee, the actual knee is in 90 degree flex position. So we had to do tibial cut and we initially started because this deformity is very quite well fixed. Although there is appears to be a fracture line there, there was no mobility at the level of those deformities. So it was healed on the posterior part. So we decided to start with the proximal tibial and distal femoral cut. Now, after taking this proximal cut, the tibial cut was technically taken by a free hand going exactly parallel to the articular surface over here. So we went by a parallel cut, parallel to the articular surface. Uh, we took a very small cut just to create a space there. And it wasn't actually the primary cut to begin with. Then we went for a distal femoral cut. For that, we have to hyperflex the knee get the upper part of the femur exposed, get a distal femoral cut that allowed us the gap to open. And then we remove the osteophyte, balance the distal, uh, distal uh, extension space. And this extension space balancing was not difficult because there was no significant medial lateral laxity or in unequal soft tissue balance. So collateral ligaments were not significantly deformed. It was more like a deformity in a sagittal plane. So we prepared the distal femur by removing the posterior osteophyte, by removing the anterior osteophyte. And uh, then uh, you can see that the TBL cut was taken technically by putting the tibia in a freehand technique, going parallel to the joint surface over here. Uh, this was when we had done the distal uh, extension gap. And you can see that the spacer is kept and the knee is still in a 90 degree flex appearing position because of the deformity but at the level of the knee it is extended knee and once we are done that this is the top picture we have put the distal femur which is prepared we have put the trial tibia which is also prepared and now after putting this trial component we were ready to do the correction osteotomy so now we the simple procedure of doing the corrective osteotomy at this time is if you see these two deformities. This is the proximal deformity and that's the anterior surface of the proximal tibia. So the simple principle is you take a cut which is at 90 degree to the mechanical axis on the anterior surface. Somebody has a note. And then we take a distal cut again perpendicular to the middle shaft of the tibia. So automatically you get a wedge what is required to correct that deformity. And you have to take the cut in such a way that your two ends meet at the posterior cortex. Try not to cut through the posterior cortex. We make a small perforated multiple holes so that to break the posterior cortex open. Now, benefit of taking this cut at 90 degree is automatically when you close the osteotomy, the two cuts become perpendicular to the mechanical axis. So similar thing in a distal deformity which was much lesser than the proximal deformity. We took a cut perpendicular to the tibial surface, proximal part, another cut perpendicular to the distal uh, part of the tibia, uh, perpendicular to the anterior surface and uh, remove the wedge from the front and then we correct the whole thing together. You can see that after correction the, there is a alignment which is quite straight in a lateral position and this is how the you can see in a lower part the ostrum was kept perpendicular to the mechanical surface of the anterior tibia while making the cut. So after taking the ostromies, the whole tibia aligned reasonably well. At that point, we opened the medullary cavity and put the intramedullary rod. So you can see that when the intramedullary rod was put along with the trial component, these two ostromies 
were aligned very well and fortunately there was no significant rotation stability now in the previous case somebody had asked a question should you put a plate and when you should put a plate now the simple thing is now suppose you have done this ostrotomy you have closed the ostrotomy you have put the trial tbl component with the longest stem which you can get so that it can bypass both the ostrotomies and go into the distalmost part of the tibia at that point try to flex and extend the knee and try to give a little rotational tuck and if you find that your ostrotomy opens up in either flexion or extension or become unstable that means the intramedullary rod is not holding the ostrotomy site very well in which case feel free to put a small plate either spanning one or both the ostrotomies and you can put a unicortical screw as a day rotation plate as it has been mentioned in the past on this particular patient when we actually flexed and extend the whole t uh, on the left you can see the extension of the deep knee and that's the flex knee with the patella re uh, put into position there was no significant problem or rotation or uh, instability seen at the level of the fracture maybe because we have kept the posterior soft tissue intact and that posterior soft tissue if it is kept intact when taking anterior close wedge and just make multiple drill holes to open that posterior cortex usually that soft tissue prevents uh, the instability and allow you to just use the intramedullary rod but it is very important to decide on table to make sure that you are able to get a good stability and you must be visually confirm the stability by doing flexion extension position and making sure that the ostrotomy do not open up in any of this position so this was the picture at the end of the surgery and that's the picture a uh, post op picture it's almost about 3 years since 3 3 and a half year from the operation both the knees have been done now both the knees are straight the patient is able to walk quite well uh and he is gone back to his normal activity and normal job so any questions uh harish is a yeah. very educative case um a very unique case uh, from the uh, um, etiopathology also was very unique and the kind of deformity this patient had so my first question to you will be harish that patient had a uh, almost a 70 degree flexion deformity at a very crucial area so just for the benefit of audience would you explain about the osteotomy because the doing the osteotomy at this side the vascular structures are closest in in this yeah. in this area so one has to be very very careful and i agree with you that doing the multiple drill holes is a far better method than doing than using the oscillating saw so what, what no, ba basically when we talk about the osteotomy you can see that you uh, the simple principle is your ostrotomy site like in a proximal ostrotomy the proximal cut has to be perpendicular to the anterior surface of tibia don't open completely go close to the uh, the deformity cut a portion here and cut a wedge parallel on that area open and you may not have reached to the deeper most part of your cut then expand the cut by going more proximal and more distal on both the sides so automatically you'll come to a point where you can see that you are reaching the posterior cortex and if you are not sure about it all you can do is just use the drill bit a small drill bit and go through the posterior part and see how much depth you have there then you can use the either a small ostrotomy or use the multiple small drill bits and drill holes and then automatically the posterior cortex that open i am not very comfortable trying to use the saw and going all the way from front to back through and through that the most risky thing you can do because this is a area where your neurovascular structures are quite close and you can easily damage them so you have to be very careful doing this one only thing is we initially thought that i may have to do also the ostrotomy of the fibula because that also had ostrotomy at multiple level but surprisingly i didn't do it in the beginning but surprisingly when i did a close ostrotomy and close both the levels it could easily come without i doing anything for the fibula i cannot explain why it happened but i didn't have to do it and yeah that was my question actually <laughs> it, yeah it didn't spring open because if if the fibula is coming in a way then you may force that ostrotomy close the that open after taking the wedge it will close on its own but the moment you leave the pressure it will open up because the fibula will act like a shut and if it that is happening then i would have to go back and maybe take a small side incision and may have done 
one or two fibular level ostomy to allow my tibial ostomy to close back but i didn't have to do it but you have to keep that in your mind no, very right and i think the vascular structures approximately in this area is very very important point to be noted by by everyone who is trying to do a case a similar case Uh, the, uh, the just a comment i think so yeah. on fibula uh, harish there were multiple fractures on fibula if you see on the x ray so yeah. fibula might have collapsed to start with only so the length of the fibula might be short uh, when you started so that was perhaps the reason why it did not act as a strut and it was already short so when you did the tibial uh, repair everything fell in place so that's just a thought process actually what we have seen Maybe. is that when when there is a small amount of deformity then usually the fibular ostomy is not required Correct. but in this case you you are right that could be a possible uh, reason hmm. that harish could do it without that dr briard what's your uh, what's your opinion on this case it's a very interesting case uh, you you <coughs> unmute yourself please uh, un unmute yourself Okay. In the yeah. last case, in the last cases we were dealing with tibial deformity. It's much easier. So uh, I think this was perfectly done. Uh, we had an acute angle at this uh, at this level, and uh, we uh, the osteotomy was perfectly done. Uh, you you do a wider osteotomy. You close it. That's what we had to do. It was perfect. Very, very good decision. Very well done. Two osteotomies, I think. Uh, Harish, a question yeah. from Dr. Uttam Gar. Yeah. Uh, how do you take care of the vascular insufficiency in long duration, fixed flexion deformity, uh, correcting at a stretch? No, and this. Is the yeah. Have, has has there been a shortening in this case, post operative? Uh, well the patient had so much deformity that the you correct the deformity the leg become long anyway than what it was before Correct. so patient is not worried about the close wedge effect causing shortening because he was not able to walk he is if you can see uh, that great video is not playing very well but you can see the picture when he standing now and when he was standing before the surgery he was standing almost like you know like that so mm -hmm. he was happy that the leg is straight he was happy that uh, he is able to stand without any limp so i don't think length is an issue and if you do a close wedge ostomy you are actually shortening the limb so the chances of vascular insufficiency will not come because of correction of deformity the problem come if you are trying to do open wedge ostomy which obviously we couldn't have done because that would have caused a posterior open wedge which is technically and theoretically very difficult to do so if you do entry close wish your vascular structures do not get stretched so i am not worried about that it's it's very right i think that keeping the posterior cortex uh, basically the the, uh, the uh, membrane intact the periosteum intact is very important and, because that gives a stability and it makes the osteotomy side unite faster yeah uh, and you keep the knee flat the next night huh? and you monitor the part <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> May ask one question. You know, yeah. Aris, uh, like uh, you know, Vikas showed in the earlier case. Could you da have done the osteotomy first and uh, fixed with a <laughs> in a unicortical screw plate and then open the joint and? So what ha the what happened is, if I if the uh, the deformities are well fixed, then manipulating the upper tibia becomes easy with the intact but deformed femur. And as I mentioned, when I had to do the surgery. i had to actually i did a femur first i have to hyperflex the tibia and even after hyperflexing the tibia you can see that a part of the femur only get exposed because in a normal extended knee if you can see here my tibia is at almost 90 degree so if i take tibia to 130 degree then my knee in the front open as 45 degree so it's like you are going to prepare the femur with the knee which can open only 40 degree uh, flexion and that is not difficult and in a stiff knee we anyway do it so you prepare the femur remove the posterior ossified the whole thing becomes simple you can take upper tibia cut uh, with your experience parallel to the joint line give a adequate slope based on your anterior shin level and then uh, 
uh, you should be able to do the primary knee much more easier because there is no significant uh, coronal plane deformity. I don't need to do a lot of release. So once I am finished with my primary TKR, then it is easy to do the osteotomy. Otherwise, if I do osteotomy first, then I have to fix it. And when I fix it, my rods come in a way and I, I am committed to the plate. So I'm just increasing my complexity for no reason. Yeah, I, I agree with you. And I think most of us will agree that your simplicity of the surgery is to do osteotomy as much correction as much is needed after the fixation. Uh, Harish, there is a question from Dr. Shyam Mukhi. Yeah. Uh, do you put a cancellous bone as primary graft? I, I think yes. Uh, in this case, the osteotomy fortunately happened so well that when I closed it, there was no gap in between. Now, if my primary cuts are closed quite well after the surgery, I wouldn't like to put a dead bone even though it is a cancellous bone. Mm -hmm. So you can see the picture on table how well the osteotomy bones have closed. Mm -hmm. I am, And they are at exactly 90 degrees to the mechanical axis of tibia. So the moment I have finished the surgery, the patient was doing full weight bearing from the next day. And every weight bearing step, he was compressing the osteotomy site. Mm -hmm. So here I haven't, I haven't put... a uh, the, the bone graft. But suppose my cut was slightly off uh, 90 degree and there was maybe a couple of millimeter of gap opening either medially or laterally. Then I would have put a graft and impacted it inside. Definitely, yes. That's a good option to do. Yeah, that's a good option because you have a graft available and, yeah. you, and you, if, you're, if you're able to close the wound, <laughs> then putting the graft is not a problem. Uh, th thank you so much. Uh, and now we'll move on to the next two very interesting cases. Um, Dr. Manoj Badwa from Chandigarh uh, will speak about uh, uh, the commonly, commonly found situation of deformities, the post high tibial osteotomy, uh, total knee osteoplasty. Uh, Manoj, please. So unmute, please. Okay, yeah. Thanks, uh, Subhanshu and Rajiv, for giving platform today to speak on. Uh, post HTO high tibial osteotomy TKR conversions. Uh, I'll just present two or three small cases to walk us through on this. So different studies, obviously we know of the couple of them could say comparable to primary TKR, couple of them say inferior, but the baseline is it is technically more challenging. I would call it a complex primary conversion with a variety of challenges that come across when you have these high tibial osteotomy conversions. First, as already mentioned by a couple of my previous speakers, you have multiple scars because obviously you have an implant inside in this and uh, little more scar to be taken on for lateral scars in a closing bed osteotomy, normally they're not an issue. We give a small stab, take out the staple and proceed with it. For medial scars, again, you can move on. But the whole point to remember is there should be at least two to five to three centimeter of gap if you want to use a parallel NCN. And if you are joining the NCN, it has to be at 50 to 60 degrees angle. You get a variety of types, commentary closing wedge, infratubercal osteotomy, macket dome osteotomy, medial opening wedge osteotomy. And all of these would have a different approach in a couple of times to proceed forward because the technicalities are at times different. With a different kind of implants, you can always choose whether you are going to go in for a single stage or you want to have two stages. And a couple of times when we have plates put in, we do this uh, procedure in two stage. We take out the plates first and then subsequently take it for TKR. In all other cases where there's a staple or K-wires or just screws, it's a single stage. So the first case is 65-year-old lady, eight years post high tibial osteotomy. Uh, this is the AP and lateral views, and uh, as rightly mentioned through, we know that is a hyper-corrected lateral closing wedge, osteotomy, vulgus joint line, and uh, patella baha on the way, stiffness of the patella that you're going to go through. And this is the lateral wedge. If you see, this is the kind of cut that you're going to have through. You have a vulgus remodeling of tibia already developed through. You go on the lateral sagittal side also, there is a translation. There is a downward or an anterior slope of tibia. Uh, I don't know how you felt, Rob, but whenever we have seen these conversions, we have seen that in all these high tibial osteotomies where you have a closing wedge osteotomy, we normally find anterior slopes. In all those medial opening wedge osteotomies, we normally find enhanced posterior slope. So there is majority of times a patella baha in all these cases because of the contracture of the extensor apparatus. And everting the patella is always a problem. Exposing the lateral side is an issue. 
whatever it is you have to protect a avulsion of patellar tendon you can always put a pin at the tibial tubercle my threshold for using cordyceps snip in these cases would be very very low hardly ever we require a tibial tubercle osteotomy in these uh, sto conversions so in these cases the points to remember as i said through was the anterior slope of tibia so if you cut too much of tibia what you have is a huge flexion gap so be very very meticulous you don't want to cut too much of the tibia at the back you want to restore equal flexion extension gaps as anoop also mentioned for addressing all these uh, patella bahas you resect less of distal femur and superiorize the patellar component this would walk you off majority of these deformities uh, in cases where we have defects we normally try to bypass them with extension rods and get across this situation now the second case that we have through is uh, 58 year old female operated case of high tibial osteotomy lateral closing wedge osteotomy 7 years back with lc fixation was done somewhere else i didn't have the record of that and uh, anterior midline ncn was there subsequent implant removal was done one year back and now she presented with pain and disability so this is an undercorrected varus deformity plates already moved scar taken off uh posterior slope of tibia patella baha is majority of times there in all these deformities as we can say if you try to align the mechanical axis you have an exaggerated varus deformity in these cases so the point again is approach which again is a midline approach as has already been used the tibial cut we know in these cases we will have a bigger lateral side than thinner medial side the slope of the tibia is very very important to look in you don't want to give too much of the slope 0 to 3 degrees is good enough the tibial component design you normally do not require stems in these cases and patella tracking again how do you circumvent the patella baha is the same philosophy as you rightly see in this case these kind of lateral scars are normally not an issue so this is the post op structure of this case so third and small case is this 51 year old female post sto 39 months back now this is a typical kind of session where you have a abrupt change in the lateral tibial flare this is where your positioning of the tibial component is going to be a big issue as you rightly see in this case we have a posterior slope of tibia patella baha is there in cell severity ratio is less than 1 there is a altered medolateral slope this is an intraarticular correction of extraarticular deformity you want to centralize the stem but in all these closing wedge osteotomies where there is a change in the flare of lateral tibial cortex you are have to be very very concerned for the relative position of the medullary canal if you use a conventional tibial platform you are going to hit on to the lateral cortex so that's where you need to calculate your angles calculate your positions certain tricks to handle across this is you medialize the tibial stem just undersize the middle uh, this one uh, tibial tray you will have a certain amount of uh, under coverage on the lateral side and you can still prevent not perforating the lateral cortex now this medialization of tibial stem helps but in a lot of cases you don't have a choice and you have to go with these kind of uh, offset stems you have taken out the staple through a lateral incision and these are the kind of offset keels that you can use to circumvent these diseases or in case of defect you can use an offset stem so you have to remember if you use a conventional tray and you are hitting the lateral cortex you might perforate it off so a post sto tkr offset is definitely a consideration in these kind of cases and you need to have a medialized positioning of your tibial tray but excessive medialization also a problem because you do not want to hamper the patellofemoral tracking so the trick to handle this is you should calculate the tibial flare index it's a ratio you take the distance across the maximum width of the tibia which is point a you draw a vertical line from the lateral flare and this calculation is b so a on b the moment it is less tibial flare is less than 2.5 you have to anticipate difficulty in tibial tray placement as you see pictures like this where the tray placement is definitely going to be hindrance and you need to have your medial offsets along with you on table so the points to remember in a sto conversion is it's a difficulty in placement of tibial components the exposures are tough a because of the scar b because you have a sort of scarring on the lateral side patellar adhesions and patella baha that you need to take care not to worsen the patellar tendon preferably implants should be removed before tkr if they are plates like these we take two in sort of uh, two separate surgeries for all staples at a single stage 
possibility of subacute infection does always remain on and intraoperative frozen section or gram strain staining is something that you can keep on if you need to change it to a two stage revision so to summarize a successful total knee after sto is technically more challenging uh, you need to take care of your exposure part snip normally helps you you have to try to subluxate the patella not try to avert because you have to prevent the avulsion of it preoperative tabulating and calculation is really very helpful and more than 5 mm medialization of tibial component should be avoided due to high risk of subluxation or dislocation of patella and bad patellar femoral dynamics so in those cases where you require too much of medialization the idea is you should have a offset stems with you on table so in all these cases as we have been seeing with all these extra articular deformity corrections our planning is very very important if we fail to plan our plan is going to fail thank you so much and i am more than happy to answer any questions that you get across on this topic it's a wonderfully explained the variety of high table osteotomy and it is rightly said that all the knees post osteotomy cannot be labeled as in one group it depends upon how the osteotomy was done what is the level of stiffness what is the level of uh, correction or over correction um, and what is the level of, of what is the situation of the scarring is i think it's very well explained and rightly said that uh, you have to have a offset stem ready especially in post post sto cases uh, i think it's it's very, it's very well done uh, dr briard has been dealing with many many cases of uh, post osteotomy uh, john we what's your uh, uh, opinion about the uh, high table post high table osteotomy total knee arthroplasty do you think that the results will be same or do you tell your patients that uh, results are, may not be the same as the normal uh, knee and manoj yeah. you also can answer this yeah infection is a problem so yeah. i think it's uh, when the healing was not uh, straightforward i think you have to do it in two stage i think you are right that's very important i think uh, closing wedge and opening wedge are different i think clo closing wedge we have the problem and we need uh, we need uh, to have offset stem sometimes so we have to be ready but planning is very important and uh, uh, medial uh, medial opening wedge it's much easier i think uh, now we see mostly uh, opening wedge well they, they are much better done now i think uh, we don't see a uh, huge over correction uh, with a staple as we used to see i think now revision of hto is is more simple but i think uh, uh, when you look at the literature people are saying that so well it's like a primary knee i, I don't think so i think we have uh, more complications skin complication more infection and uh, so it's not uh, like a typical pr simple primary knee but now we are asking more we want better results and uh, i think uh, the <laughs> so we have to be uh, very careful uh, to what we can promise to, to our patient and the risk of the risk of complication especially if you have comorbidities Uh, thank you john wick uh, manoj what's your what's your do you tell your patients uh, anything different in the results uh, the expectation for results in post uh, sto cases raji for all of us i believe sitting on this dais we all have done far less of these htos per se what we do is sto done by somebody else my problem is that when we look at majority of high table osteotomies they are not done the right way either they are under tracked or they are over tracked or huge amount of slopes couple of cases where you get across where you have a sagittal pain translations and you have to do it so so if it is a simple closing wedge with a staple going in it somebody can expect the same end point but needless say if i would say majority of the cases they are far more complex the rehab would remain the same for a patient but uh, secondary chances of infection do remain on because technical parts you can solve them on table that is your headache mm -hmm. from the patient perspective your skin healing issues and late secondary infection issues is what you have to be counseling them for yeah one take home message should be that uh, whatever implants you remove on the table must be sent the implant wash must, must be sent for the extended culture i, I think that's, that's very rightly mentioned by you and dr priyad uh, shubhran yes. you have any question for dr man um, 
very less you keep 0 to 3 degrees 0 degrees as a posterior slope angle and you resect very small sliver so it's roughly around 6 mm of the bone you remove off because you don't want to end up with a huge flexion gap so that can be handled through as sagittal pain deformity the anterior posterior posterior translations is definitely a huge headache normally you use the i try to use stems uh, this one tibial components with a small key so that it does not hit the posterior cortex you at least come across situation where it is almost 50% of an overlap you put a normal component you would perforate the posterior cortex and move at the back so you need the tibial tray with a small key that's the only way you can run off these situations yeah dr brad your opinion regarding anteroposterior translation uh, in sto usually you know it is done to uh, offload the patellofemoral joint pressures Okay, the the patella is is a is a problem because uh, well we have when we look at our patient we have uh, the flexion is diminished and uh, and uh, we have patella barra and uh, so uh, that's a, that's a concern uh, we can't promise a bit high flexion and uh, and they may have more anterior knee pain so when you have a, a AP. Uh, if it's if it's really uh, very very displaced we may have to do uh, to redo the osteotomy okay right. so thank you it's rare very rare but yeah thank you john we uh, dr krishna kiran uh, please present your case yeah uh, thanks dr rajiv uh, dr mohanty so uh, we've seen from uh, dr bright's presentation that there are three ways of handling extraarticular deformity one is through extensive soft tissue release and intraarticular correction two is intraarticular correction with an epicondylar osteotomy and three is with an osteotomy with tkr either staged or uh, simultaneous so my case will look at uh, three three points which have not been covered in the femoral deformity uh, and i'll go through them as we go along so this is a 72 year old man with a left knee pain with a history of fracture femur 30 years back managed conservatively his bmi is 32.2 and his difficulties of activities of daily living for the past 2 years this is his short leg x ray which shows that there is a nearly 19 degrees deformity at the uh, meta metadiaphyseal junction of the femur it has been illustrated previously uh, i will reiterate you have to measure the length of the femur if the deformity is 1/5 away from the uh, joint then the impact will be the actual deformity minus 1 by 5 into the deformity so if it is 20 degrees deformity at the metadiaphyseal level and 1/5 of 20 will be 4 degrees so actual impact at the joint will be around 16 degrees so further you go away from the joint line the impact on the joint will be lesser and lesser so this particular patient had a sagittal plane deformity also a hyperextension of 10 degrees and this is the long leg film which is a prerequisite for all these patients uh, with extra articular deformity to to make a preoperative plan in addition we must do a clinical examination flex the knee and see the heel relationship with the ischial tuberosity if it is going lateral to the ischial tuberosity then there is an internal rotation to this and then it warrants further investigation in the form of a ct scan but if it's going medial then you may not need to do a, a ct scan routinely in all the cases because the external rotation is easier to handle than internal the prerequisites for intraarticular correction of extraarticular deformity are you draw the mechanical axis of the tibia and femur the distal resection of the femur must not violate the collateral ligament and you have some tips to uh, get over this uh, which we will discuss as we go along and in general as per wolf and hungerford uh, paper less than 20 degrees of coronal and sagittal plane deformity on the femur and less than 30 degrees of coronal deformity on the tibia can be corrected with intraarticular correction so this particular case the preoperative plan you draw the mechanical axis you can see there is significant mechanical axis deviation the femoral deformity affects the extension gap so this is an important point because 
the ability to correct it with soft tissue releases goes out of the window because if you release the tibial sleeve uh, then it will affect both the extension and flexion gap and if you do too much of a release as dr bride rightly pointed out you will have to internally rotate the femoral component to close down your flexion gap on the medial side which will be asymmetrically increased so this is an important point to keep in mind while correcting femoral deformity in this case when we drew the line it was barely resecting the lateral collateral ligament so this again was an open uh, to discussion type of uh, uh, decision so we went ahead with an intraarticular correction keeping in mind the age of the patient what we did do was we used technology to do a, a permissible varus cut so we all know that the varus on the femoral side is more tolerated and if you use cas or robotics you can do a 2 or 3 degree varus cut without compromising the collateral ligament once you make the tibial cut you notice that the medial side is uh, tighter and the lateral side is lax so the both components exist so this trapezoidal gap in extension will require unique and innovative release because the ligament release will not work because it will act both in extension and flexion as we are releasing from the tibia not the femur so we must consider extra medullary alignment cm cas or robotics so this particular case was done with robotics so uh, the uh, the surgery was done using uh, the smith and few navio uh, software so we have to do a femur free collection and the tibia free collection to begin with and you have this implant planning window you can see the thing that the alignment is around 14 degree varus as we predicted based on our uh, pre operative planning and more importantly you look at the uh, the the gap assessment you can see that the gaps are almost equal on the lateral and medial side in flexion you can see that there that means just by changing the level of resection or the size of the component you can adjust that particular thing but extension disparity is much much more so you can see that the medial side is way too tighter as compared to the lateral side which is not only uh, uh, not at zero but it is lax so you have a combination of medial tightness with lateral laxity which needs to be addressed the same thing when we make our plan uh, you can see that the uh, the gap on the medial side is 8.4 mm tighter lateral side is 2.8 mm laxer in uh, in extension and in flexion both are almost similar so just by changing the femoral component position to around 2 degrees of internal rotation plus or minus 3 is okay Uh, uh because this particular insert was a genesis to implant so 2 degree internal rotation actually means that we are externally rotating the femoral component by 1 so we should not accept any internal rotation of the femoral component axial internal rotation this is a relative internal rotation as compared to that particular implant so you can see that the flexion gap is well balanced and the extension gap is uh, off by almost 9 to 10 mm so 10 mm you cannot achieve through soft tissue release So we did a, a an intentional varus cut on the femur and uh, did our uh, technique. And what we noticed was we were able to get the knee to full extension, uh, but it was going into varus because of lateral laxity. So there was no medial tightness. It was more lax in extension on the lateral side. So if this laxity goes beyond six degrees, that is when we do a lateral partial condylar slide. So you can measure that thing, and that was what was done. And this is the post-op gap assessment. we were able to correct the overall alignment to 1 or 2 degree varus and you can see the curve there very nice uh, a millimeter or two of laxity in extension nice and tight in mid flexion and a millimeter or two of laxity in flexion so that's what you get with the uh, robotic thing and this is the post operative x ray showing our ability to get away in this complex case with a, a relatively less constrained implant so this patient uh, uh, is doing well is around 3 to 4 months out and uh, osteotomy has healed and is walking uh the take home message is that the pre operative planning is critical robotics has potential to give real time intraoperative and soft tissue picture which helps us to fine tune the operation for that patient the flexion gap can usually be adjusted by altering the component size tibial slope and femoral rotation extension gap is balanced balanced usually by tailored soft tissue release so you must release posterior medially on the tibia and femur in this case and sometimes the excessive lateral laxity may need an advancement osteotomy if the medial side is too tight and the lateral side is okay then you may have to do a medial condylar osteotomy thank you uh, thank you krishna it is a, it's a wonderful uh, presentation uh, of a very unique case so with this case we could complete almost uh, uh, all the uh, different types of the deformities different types of the methods available right from the uh, tra traditional conventional instrument based to computer navigation to robotic um, 
Dr. Briard, uh, do you have any question on this? Well, that's a good example that yeah. you can you can get good stability in extension by uh, playing with us uh, for coronal eh? by playing with uh, your sliding osteotomy. It's not, it's very simple now. If you are stable in flexion, and then if you are, uh, if you are not stable in extension, you play with a sliding osteotomy and you, you get sold. Hmm. Very, very, very right, yeah. Shubrancho, you have any question? No, a, any, any of the faculty would do a, you know, extra articular femoral osteotomy and do a conventional way in case your robotics, you know, this is an ideal case for your uh, navigation and robotics, but uh, any of the faculty would do without uh, in a conventional ways. Uh, I, I think that what Krishna did is right, because in this case, doing the, um, doing the femoral osteotomy would have been difficult. Um, um, yeah. The kind of deformity, kind of the uh, preoperative uh, bone he has. In this, in this, the there is a uh, even the sagittal plane. There is a lot of malunion is there. So a conventional osteotomy and then a TKR will be a real complex. It will make it still more complex and uh, add a lot of uh, problems. So this is either a navigation or a robotics case. Yeah. Yes, this was the perfect case for the uh, support of navigation or robotic because the distal femur was actually an extension. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. These are the cases, you know, which require really, you know, this um, gadgets uh, that uh, simply you can go away with. Go away. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Shubhrash, there has been a question on the YouTube about yeah. the uh, uh, kind of the rectus uh, release that we do and the post-operative protocol. So any of the faculty or uh, would like, would you like to take that? You mean the rectus snip? Yes. The question is that what is the method of rectus snip? Yeah. Okay. So basically, yeah. 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 Uh, basically, when you want to do a rectus snip, it's like a oblique cut that goes into the tendon from medial to the lateral side. Okay. It's like an oblique incision. Obliques are on around forty-five degrees, going from medial to lateral, which is more or less like extension of your arthrotomy incision. So, do you use the scissors for this, or no, no, no. knife, 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 knife? Yeah, I use a knife. I use a deep knife, and okay. then you know, with that one stroke, just cut it across so that you know we are able to flip the patella laterally, and then probably that will give you even you know a little bit of flexion also. Then you can start working on uh, resecting and clearing the gutters. So, is to get. Adi, some what do you do? Uh, do what? you want to use the knife in this in these cases? What, what level you do? Asit, what level you do? Unmute, uh, Harish. Yeah, uh, we should do it at a level of the proximal end of your tendon. The tendon, the quadricep yeah, tendon, tendon ends almost about, uh, say, 8 to 10 centimeters proximal to the upper end of the patella. Beyond that, it should go obliquely into the mus pa mus muscle, parallel to the muscle fiber. There is another thing, there is a called reverse snip, where you come yeah. down inferiorly on the lateral side yeah. of the patella. And he extend that further down. It's called Coons Adams reverse flap. Now, this is another way of exposing it, but it is not recommended many times because it can cause a significant amount of quadricep oh, nice. mechanism damage. So normally what we do is, is going up proximally and lateral so that uh, it opens along the muscle plane. And maybe when you close, you, yeah. you put the knee in fraction. Yeah. And if you are oblique, you can cheat a bit and you lengthen a bit. Huh? Lengthen a bit. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Post-op uh, protocol will be same. You know, we don't uh, immobilize. That was a question, I think, so Subranchu, uh, from the delegate. So post-op protocol will be same as you do for any other standard total knee or any middle paraparator arthrotomy. It doesn't change at all. And yeah. the close, closer you do with Vicryl or uh, any, any other special sutures? Uh, I use ethibon just for that snip part, you know, one the oblique part, you know, use the ethibon. One suture of ethibon. Yes. yes well, you, you may question. have two reasons to do this for exposure. So we do it, uh, but I said snicks we talk, talk about, but sometimes you want to lengthen your extensor mechanicism. Then 
pie crusting is another issue. Right. And you win 10 to 20 degrees. Right. The other question from YouTube, uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Mukhi is asking, why don't you do non-modular tibial component which lasts longer in younger patients? So basically the, uh, the faculty opinion about the non-modular uh, tibial component, which could be the all poly component or could be the... Uh, uh, back, uh, AGC, AGC is what he AGC uses. Uh, monoblock component. Theoretically, it is supposed to be better. There is no question because there is no back wear and it's a molded and fixed to the metal back. But, uh, well, it's an individual choice. I don't think with a better uh, locking mechanism or if you use a rotating platform design, then the back wear issue doesn't come into picture. So you do not have to use a, uh, you know, a non-modular uh, TBL component. It's not necessary unless you want to uh, reduce the cost by using all poly component, which may be about 15 to 20 percent cheaper compared to the met metal back component. We do that in patient who cannot afford, and when the bone quality is reasonably good, to allow the all poly component to be fixed. So that's when we use a non-modular component. But we are we all are on the same page that in in today's time, most of the simple cases. You do not need to change the size of the poly. If you have decided to go for 10, in most cases, you will go for 10 only. So that that argument, that, that discussion that you may change the size of the poly is not uh, uh, very true in most hands. What do you say on that? No, that's correct. But there is no need to change your habit. Right. Absolutely. Both of them are equally good. If you're comfortable with monoblock, use it. No harm. Uh, so, any of our faculty is using the uh, monoblock? You know, in some cases, yeah, Krishna, you you. Yeah, yeah, yeah so do. not there for all three people. things. There, there are three things. So, you know, in modular components, now we have a polystibial component. Number two, highly crossing poly, and number three, a good locking mechanism. So, there are three things uh, now. It is uh, that has improved the outcome of your, uh, you know, modular components. Number two, when you do a revision surgery, sometimes, you know, you want to exchange the polyethylene or you have to do a dire procedure, something like that. When you require only polyethylene exchange, then you have to take out all of the tibial component. That is one of the disadvantages of the monoblock component. Unless it's all poly component, you know, metal back uh, monoblock component, uh, there are certain issues, though it has got a good long-term outcome. Dr. Brad want to say something. Yes. Yeah, Dr. Brad. Uh, John, oh, uh, what is your opinion about the monoblock uh, TBL component? Well, for infection, uh, well, I, I think it's better to clean uh, a knee with a modular implant because uh, if you do a dare, you have to go and clean behind. That's a key. Hmm. So, See, another advantage well, of modular, right. uh, few of the companies you know, they make this uh, modular component. We can apply a stem at the tibia. Or if you want to add an augment on the tibia, you can do that. In all poly or in a monoblock, that is the AGC knee, you cannot do any of this. So if you have a straightforward cut and straightforward case, uh, fine. All poly or uh, monoblock uh, is fine. But if you have to do any of these things, then you cannot do this. You cannot do the uh, monoblock. Yes. So it's better to have one set of implants with which you can treat all your most of your cases. So it's easier for you as a surgeon and as your uh, operating room team also. Yes. Is it very, very right. Th th thank you so much. I think we must thank, thank all the faculty who presented uh, wonderful cases, especially to Dr. Briard, who uh, gave, gave us a very good uh, insight about the... Uh, uh, about the extra articular deformities and uh, with the experience of Dr. Briard, probably we all have been en enriched. The, all the faculty have shown a, a wonderful, difficult variety of cases uh, which were dealt with so, so in a, so a much simpler way. Needless to say that all these cases of extra articular deformity are tough cases. Uh, one has to have a lot of uh, preparation for such cases. And what we have seen here, uh, we, we, I'm sure that our uh, um, Delegates must have learned a lot uh, from these difficult presentations. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, Shubranchu, maybe you'd like to.
Yeah, thank you, Rajiv. That was an excellent webinar on uh, correction of extraarticular deformities during total knee replacement. On behalf of Indian Arthroplasty Association, we convey our gratitude for, for Dr. Brad, who has been sitting right from the beginning till the end and uh, you know giving his opinion in different uh, difficult uh, situations. Uh, and we expect uh, you know same kind of uh, you know his presence in uh, different webinars in future. May I uh, give our thanks to Dr. Rajiv K. Sharma, who has been kind enough to uh, moderate this session. And all the presenters, uh, you know, they have presented different, different uh, cases in different situations. Thank you all. And for the viewers, thank you for uh, viewing this webinar. And uh, we expect uh, that uh, we'll be continuing this webinar, then uh, we'll uh, announce the various topics beforehand so that you can send your cases and you can you know, present your cases in this webinar as well. And I thank you all and have a nice evening. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, so much. Thank thank you, you. everybody. Can we stop the live stream?